Marketing Manager here at Pepsi Publishing. Welcome everyone to this special three-hour event with Dr. Kate Truitt on self-havening. This is going to be a wonderful training all about treating trauma with self-havening, and I can't wait for us to get started. So with that, here's Dr. Kate Truitt. Thank you, Carson, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. It is such a joy and an honor to be here with everyone today. Just want to cover a couple logistical elements to provide support before we dive into the slide deck. Let me fix my quick uh, view here. So as we know, this is a PESI training, and so we have a couple disclosures that we're going to quickly go through. So just play, being mindful that we are here to learn some amazing healing in your hands tools and learn all about the neurobiology of self-havening, these wonderful new uh, modalities that have been growing and expanding over the past couple of decades. And so please be mindful of your scope of practice as we're integrating these tools and practicing them. And our vision is that you will be learning things that you can take into your personal life and your clinical space. And of course, we always want to be mindful of staying within our realm and our scope of practice. And then additionally, uh, conflict of interest disclosures are on the PESI website, so you're welcome to check those out. And in terms of chat box and Q&A, I am joined here today by one of my fellow trainers at my training institute, uh, Rebecca Turner, LMFT, BCN. And so she will be providing support in the Q&A. If you have questions please, about the content, uh, clarification, please put those in the Q&A box and she will be responding or else she'll also be collecting a couple of questions that when we do go to Q&A, you'll be able to, or she'll send over to me and I will respond to. Uh, there is an upvote and a downvote option. Uh, so if there's a particular question that somebody asks and you really want to make sure that we address that question, do use that upvote thumbs up on the Q&A because that will ensure that she highlights it and puts it into uh, puts it into my brain, so to speak, so that I do speak to it. Uh, if there are technical questions, please make sure to use the chat box for those. We are joined by Tavi here from PESI who will be providing support with technology in the chat. And uh, we have received word, unfortunately, that Zoom is having a massive uh, difficulty with closed captioning right now. And of course, PESI being PESI has already identified a workaround. And so if you do want closed captioning, please see the chat box. You'll notice that there's a link there and that has a caption viewer and Tabby just put it back in the chat box again. So please open up that link and you'll be able to get the closed captioning. And I think that is all of our fun logistics. So let me share a little bit about where we're going today. And um, first, introduce myself. And Carson, again, thank you for the lovely intro. Uh, my name is Dr. Kate Truitt. I'm a Havening Techniques certified trainer, also, also one of the developers of the Havening Techniques, which is a high honor to be recognized as such, and Global Director of Research and Curriculum Development. And we're hosting this free event today in honor of book launch week of the new book, Healing in Your Hands. And the purpose of this book is exactly that. It's all about teaching tools and exercises for self-healing, because one of the things we've been learning in the field of neuroscience over the past several decades, and that Dr. Stephen and Ron Rudin, the founders of the Havening Techniques, really identified is that we do hold the capacity for self-healing within our mind and body system. Much as we can recover from a paper cut, our brain has innate mechanisms for recovering from stress, anxiety, as well as trauma. And so our journey today is to really dig into these experiences because fear is so fast. And it's much faster than many of us actually give it credit for. I'd like to introduce you to one of my patients, Wesley, in a session we had that really highlighted for me the power of the amygdala. And we'll talk a lot about Amy the amygdala today. But to start, as I sit across from my patient, Wesley, a heavy silence fills my office. His shoulders are slumped and his face is flushed. Finally, he blurts out, my boss had been going on for 20 minutes about my performance. All I could hear was how much of a failure I was. I know it was stupid, but at some point it was like I couldn't even hear him anymore. 
I just snapped at him, something rude. I don't even remember. And I stormed out, slamming the door. He sighed tirely and rubbed his eyes. I'm getting called into HR tomorrow, he continued. I think I might get fired. What is wrong with me? Why am I such an idiot? As I shared that story, you might have noticed that there have been moments like that in your own life. There certainly have been in mine. These moments that spiral us into these harmful thoughts, like calling ourselves names, like an idiot, that bring up shame and have consequences that are way beyond what we were hoping to have happen in that moment. These moments where our emotions start guiding our behaviors and our goals, designing our life in the present moment. Even if our thinking brain, our self brain is sitting there whispering quietly in the background, why are you doing this? What's happening? These very human moments are at the heart of some really exciting opportunities for healing. Now that might sound a little interesting. These triggers that take over and hijack our brain become windows of healing opportunity. And that is what this course is all about today. Identifying those moments, understanding where they come from, and utilizing these new tools for healing called self-havening and specifically these specific exercises that we'll be learning and practicing together. So our journey today is to dig into the neurobiology of self-havening. What are these new tools? Because they are new. The first training was in 2013, although the scientific exploration into these experiences began more than two decades ago by the doctors Rudin. From there, we'll start moving into a deeper understanding of this mechanism of action called the havening touch. It's an ancient opportunity for healing that neuroscience has really highlighted in powerful ways over the past two decades with incredible outcomes that indicate that the opportunity of gentle touch is not just soothing, it actually fundamentally changes our neurobiology at an electrochemical level decreasing some of those chemicals that are less than preferable, like cortisol, never fun to have a cortisol bath, while enhancing the presence of a lot of those chemicals that we like to have in our brain and our body love, like serotonin and GABA and oxytocin. And then of course, we're going to practice because it's one thing to hear it and it's a whole other opportunity to experience it. And then we'll be moving into a deeper exploration of the amygdala. Now, this might be a term that some of you are familiar with. The amygdala gets a lot of press these days and a little bit of a bad rep for being involved in fear. And that's true. She is involved in fear. She is very involved in those moments like we just talked about with Wesley. And what a lot of science is now highlighting is that she is also highly involved in cultivating the type of experiences we want more of, the positive links and as we move into our experiential processes at the end of today, you'll start to witness how we can not just heal the past, but build the future through directly working with our amygdala, calming her down, letting her know we're safe, and also building new frameworks and templates for how we want to be existing in our world. So the power of self-havening is all about this healing opportunity, harnessing our system's innate capacity for healing to create sustainable health and resilience and mental fitness. Now, havening is new, as I mentioned, newer, especially in the field of psychotherapy, where we know cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic, you know, Jung and Freud, they, they've been running around for a long time. Aaron Beck started doing his thing many, many, many moons ago. And back in 1988, Francine Shapiro took her fateful walk that gave birth to EMDR. And so when we say new, as we know in the world of psychology and science, new is about two decades. And that's around how long havening has been in the world. The opportunity of havening is both in a really critical clinical space of helping the brain release trauma, 
And also where we'll be focusing our efforts today on something called self-havening for personal empowerment. Truly the healing in your hands opportunity for how we can help our clients and our own mind and body systems heal and utilizing that havening touch and these protocols that we'll be learning. I first learned about havening back in 2014, the very, very beginning of 2014. My career in studying neuroscience and fear and trauma started all the way back in my early, early, early 20s. My personal experience of complicated feelings and experiences started way back as long as I can remember. And we have our clients who share those types of experiences with us, and we'll talk about why in just a moment when we talk about brain development. I was very lucky to be told about Havening early on. And it was very lucky for me personally, because I'd been living with PTSD for over five years. See, in 2009, a week before my wedding to a partner of 10 years, John, I came home and found that he had passed away and I was unable to save his life. And I, even though at that point, I had already studied trauma and neuroscience extensively, I was already a psychologist. I was working and living in this field that I love. I had trained in the act, what we call the alphabet soup of trauma treatment, right? The EMDR, CBT, CPT, TFCBT, all of these different treatments, TRM, CRM, they're so amazing. But I ran right into the very real fact that our brain is our brain. And no matter how much we know, if our brain is experiencing a large enough trauma or has been exposed to extreme stress for long enough, it will rewire itself. And that self part of us, just as Wesley shared with us, can start to feel like a whisper. The knowingness of what we know becomes less and less accessible because our survival brain becomes more and more powerful. And the opportunity is in learning how to speak the primal language of that electrochemical experience. So I'd like to highlight this image here for just a moment. This is McLean's work. It's old. We know it's not exactly the most up-to-date model, but what I love about it is this idea of the triune brain, which is a helpful way to think about the evolution of our mind-body system. So when we think about lizards, we wouldn't sit down and expect to have a philosophical conversation with a lizard. I mean, unless it's the gecko lizard, sure, possibly. But otherwise, probably not. And the same would largely go for our cat or our dog, although my dogs and cats are very, very good listeners, let me tell you. But they're not very great at communicating their thoughts on the deeper considerations of, you know, brain functioning. And when we look at the evolution of our species, this is a critical part of understanding our own neurobiology and information processing because we started out as ancient primal creatures that have evolved across the course of time. And when we think about lizards, they respond to the world in a sensory way. And they respond to the world through an experience of touch. And even if we go all the way back to our single cell organisms, if you remember biology 101 in high school, and if you were to tap a single cell organism, it would retract. I know we've, I remember watching that in my projector in high school. I know I just dated myself. That touch is one of the most primal and important mechanisms for helping our system understand the world. And one of the things that's great about evolution is it holds on to what works and it lets go of what doesn't work. And we have this little tiny brain part in our system called the amygdala. There's actually two of them. And they've been around for over 300 million years, playing a guiding force in how we understand the world. In fact, there's some pretty exciting scientific literature that highlights that when vertebrae started to develop, amygdalae started to develop. And so over 300 million years ago, as soon as somebody turned around and had a thinking process of some sort back in, you know, 300 million years ago land that said, hey, I've got a spine. The brain also said, hey, I've got a thing that keeps us alive. Let's prioritize that. But here's the thing. We spend so much time 
navigating this world from our thinking brain and exploring and making sense of it through our thinking brain processes. And in psychotherapy, there's certainly so much prefrontal cortex focus. But these more primal parts of our system, these more these older pieces are more powerful. And survival will always trump thriving because quality of life isn't our brain's number one priority. It's actually how do we stay alive? Doesn't matter if we have a nice car, if we're not walking around and functioning. Our thinking brain came to the experience of life 70 to 300,000 years ago, depending on which literature you look at. I like to think of it as the pokey puppy to the game. It's slow. While touch has been around forever, some version of this responsiveness to the world and our amygdala 300 million years, which is way longer than any of our feet have been walking along this and around on this beautiful world of ours. And surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, developmentally, we see the same progression. Touch is one of the first sensory systems to develop in utero. Within the first trimester, our organism is starting to experience a sense of touch. The amygdala, they begin to develop in the third trimester. Before we even breathe, our amygdala are interacting with the world. And our cerebral cortex is slow to the game develops in our late 20s, early 30s, a slow, slow, slow and very important journey of development and starting to make sense of the world. But these old parts of our system, they're old guard. They've been around for so long because they work. And that means they get priority in processing the world around us. And when our brain experiences something as going wrong, those parts are going to define what's happening in that moment if the threat is big enough, whether it be a threat tied to this present moment or a threat tied to something we've learned from the past. So something happens. Wesley was sitting in that room and his boss was giving him a performance review. Now he could have had some anticipatory anxiety going into that experience. Perhaps there are some hiccups in the past. He has a whole host of experiences navigating him into that moment. And prior to walking into that space, his brain was prepping and identifying how to make sense of the information that would be coming towards him. And while that experience continued very, very rapidly, his ba most basic, one of his most basic brain parts started interpreting that data, 50 milliseconds. This part of his brain called the thalamus is chiming in and helping him to sense what is happening. Now the thalamus historically has been thought of as a post office. What we now know, and thanks in part to Dr. Andrew Huberman for his research in this space, is that the thalamus is one of our originators of the threat experience, but also how our brain starts making sense of schemas and frameworks and helping us interpret what's happening before our thinking brain comes online. And if our thalamus notices that there's some emotional experiences going on, then she's going to tie in our amygdala and go, hey, Amy, what do we know about this? The good, the bad, the ugly, the neutral, just inviting in another rapid firing brain part to help us make sense of the world. And our little friend, Amy, the amygdala, works at 75 milliseconds. Now, remember with Wesley, we talked about how fast is fear. I'd like to invite everybody to blink. Now, fear, or 75 milliseconds, is four times faster from the experience of your brain hearing the request to blink. So before your cognitive awareness, your conscious awareness said, oh, she said blink, blink, your amygdala was making sense of that. And before then, your thalamus was saying, where's this data going to go? 
And the reason you knew what an eye blink was, was because your hippocampus and your working memory system all started participating in the information processing sequence and said, we know what that word is. But when you're six months old, you certainly didn't know what that word is. Somewhere along the line, you learn that word. Or if English was your second language, even later you would learn what a blink is. Our brain has Google search capacities built into it in many respects. And the Google search is tied to the experiences of our life and the experiences that get priority processing. But notice again, 75 milliseconds, four times faster. And that is before our cognitive brain is online. Our brain is Google searching information before we're still consciously aware of it to know how to execute the next step. Now, if you chose to blink when I asked the request, your anterior single gyrus said, oh, I'm going to do the thing and prioritize that request to blink. But if you were looking at an email or if you were in the chat box or asking a question, your brain would have been prioritizing and spotlighting that. And whatever that focus was, was then when your prefrontal cortex shows up. So there's a delay, there's a lag time. And this is important when we think about Wesley. And that moment where all of a sudden he's out the door of his off of his supervisor's office, the door slammed and he stops and he goes, what did I do? And when he remembers what just happened and it happens quickly for that to go, oh, no. Then the brain can start to take over. But if that had been a wonderful performance review, he would have stayed in a green brain zone and walked out of there going, yeah can be another great quarter. We've got this. But we know that wasn't Wesley's experience. Instead, somewhere in that moment with his supervisor, his brain started to say something's wrong. And by his brain, we mean these very early information processing parts. And once those parts started to come online, his thinking would start to become cloudy. And just think about a moment where you've had a knee-jerk response of agitation or frustration or anxiety. And it felt like your thinking brain just stepped back and another part of you stepped forward and started guiding your behavior. These very human moments and these very real moments that bring our clients into our offices. And sometimes what our brain is tuning into is real. Frequently, it's tied to something from the past and it's being triggered. His boss may have never even had said to Wesley that you are a failure. There may have been something else in his life that got activated, turning off his prefrontal cortex and giving his amygdala even more power. As you see, our amygdala has the most important job in many respects. She plays a critical role in helping us stay alive. And therefore she has a lot of influence on the way our brain is making sense of the world. And in a moment of possible threat, she can lift us into a yellow brain zone, a go, no go. Is there really something here to be scared of? And even up into a red brain zone. And here in the 21st century, she's pretty good at doing that, even though she's originally designed to be on the lookout for tigers and poisonous berries when we go all the way back to our grassland days 70 to 300,000 years ago. She hasn't changed much. There is no amygdala 2.0. She's still her classic old guard self behaving in the same ways. But our prefrontal cortex is very good at spinning up all sorts of scary stories that then become a felt sense truth. And if we are living in a red brain zone for long enough, our brain can actually be rewired into that state. <clears throat> and how does that happen? Well, our brain is very cool. I'm obviously a big fan. I've been studying this stuff for a very, very long time. And we know now that the brain is made up of 86 billion neurons. Now, one of the reasons I started studying neuroscience was A, I had my own journey with mental health and wellness. And I want to understand what on earth is going on up here because life felt really hard and it didn't seem so hard for some people. And I was like, this is bizarre. And 
back in the day when I was growing up, when I took psychology, AP psychology in high school, we were still back in the 90s when it was like, well, it's a black box, or maybe the brain's capable of shifting and changing. And that there is a possibility that, you know, up until a certain time or age, we can start to be different. But after, you know, the age of 29, well, we're our brain's concrete. To me, I was like, I'm not a big fan of that. <laughs> so let's let's dive in and dig deeper. And what we know now is the brain is made up of about 86 billion neurons, and they have thousands of connections to each other. So it's like a bunch of freeways and roads and pathways going through our brain all of the time. And what becomes priority is a part of that developmental process. And I did see the note about she is the amygdala gendered, and we will go into why we call Amy the amygdala in just a little bit. We do call her Amy the amygdala very lovingly because uh, she is our fiercest, most maternal warrior protector is the way we like to conceptualize her. And if you're an IFS, object relations or gestalt person, you'll notice a little bit of that parts work coming in where it's the brain showing up to take care of us and sometimes causing these less than preferable moments. The organization of how we show up in our day-to-day -day life is based on neuroplasticity and how these streets, paths, and roads, and super freeways are defined. How we respond, how we react, what we believe. Poor Wesley in that moment, having that gut reaction and leaving and showing up in my office many days later in a panic. Was that appropriate to that moment? No. Was that a pretty good indicator that something had happened previously, whether it had been weeks, months, or even decades prior that would leave him vulnerable to being triggered in that moment? Absolutely. That's all a gift of neuroplasticity. And thankfully, the brain is capable of forming and reorganizing these synaptic connections. Those thousands and thousands of links can shift and change. And that's what this healing in your hands is all about. Because when we link into one of the oldest sensory elements of our life, touch, and use it to interact with the most powerful piece of technology on the planet, our brain, we can harness neuroplasticity to create empowered, sustained change. Specifically, if there has been something developed called stress-induced structural plasticity. Yes, we have a very specific form of neuroplasticity that is driven by norepinephrine and cortisol. And that is, this is where neuro, sometimes neuroscience is kind to us and names things exactly what it is. This is one of those moments, yay, stress-induced structural plasticity. These are super freeways through the brain that brain has said this was scary enough, important enough, big enough, threatening enough, tied to my survival enough that this is now henceforth getting priority processing. These are reasons why we don't touch a hot stove. We don't play in traffic. These are also reasons why we may become agoraphobic. Why we might have a trigger to a smell. Why for Wesley? A specific tone of voice could have triggered his brain into that red brain zone so much so that he stormed out of his performance review. So here's the thing. 90% of every moment is defined by the experiences of the past. This is a wonderful awareness that Dr. Lewis Cozzolino identified. If you're not familiar with his work, He's the founder and creator of the term neurofluency and has many powerful books about how to integrate neuroscience into the therapy space, which is all about what we're doing today. The truth is, is our brain talks to itself, 86 billion neurons talking to itself. And 10% of this moment is novel. So that 350 eye blink self experience as we just explored is heavily informed by what we have learned about ourselves and the world around us. And so if we have learned hard things, if we have learned to beat ourselves up, to have those painful cognitions or those sticky beliefs of feeling stupid or like an idiot or that broken or not good enough, those will show up and take over. And it's not just about PTSD, as we know. These super freeways become guiding forces for how we see the world, not just with our thoughts, but also with how our body is functioning. 
how we're making sense of the moment. So we've talked a lot about the brain and the old guard amygdala. And let's shift now to the old guard touch. When you're stressed, what do you do? And when you see somebody else having a hard time, is there something that you are pulled to do? Now, sometimes when we're stressed ourselves, we might go for an easy button. I know that I like my cat memes. They're cute, kittens are adorable. Netflix, guilty. Easy button, zone out state. But I would never go to a friend who's having a hard time and put an Instagram in front of their face and scroll cat memes for them. Instead, I might put my hand on their shoulder and go, hey, are you okay? Gentle touch. I might walk up to somebody and give them a hug if I haven't seen them in a long time. If I have a tension headache, I might gently run my fingers across my forehead. Or if you've ever wiped away a tear, there's a very specific set of little fibers embedded in our skin that are just as ancient as our species and mammals in of themselves. And these receptors calm our mind and body down just as breath work does for our body, soothing touch actually does for our brain. And there's a reason why humans are called towards touch. And if we remember the wire monkey studies going all the way back to high school or undergraduate, graduate school, where the monkeys had all the sustenance they needed, but they didn't have soothing touch, they were impacted developmentally. Same with the children in the Romanian orphanages. All of the basic needs met, but no touch. Their brains are actually smaller. Touch is a foundational human experience that plays a critical role in helping our mind and body develop a sense of secure safety in the world. But don't take it from me, take it from the scientists. Soothing touch promotes positive affect. There's a reason why we reach out and hold somebody's hand. There's a reason why when we dance, we might move around and also use our hands and even snap. Those fibers are in our palms. Touch has been shown to reduce heart rate and blood pressure. The havening touch has been shown to, sh to reduce these experiences in longitudinal studies. It lowers norepinephrine, which is a excitatory neurotransmitter, and increases oxytocin. We like oxytocin, that's a yummy one. Decreases cortisol, it can even activate the smile muscle. And it slows the system down, especially when we're in a heightened state of awareness or in that red brain zone. And in doing that, enhances the presence of GABA as well as serotonin. GABA is the opposite of glutamate. If you yourself or any of your clients have ever taken gabapentin, it's because it's helping the system calm. And GABA is something that we do create naturally. But when we have a lot of cortisol, we have less GABA. And of course, we're all familiar with serotonin, the antidepressant commercials, the sad droopy rock going on a topping journey with the rain. Serotonin is very helpful and plays a critical role in safety. Havening developed out of this awareness that the application of soothing touch creates the electrochemical representation of safety in the mind and body. That's actually where the name havening came from. The original scientific name for the clinical interventions of havening was the amygdala deep potentiation technique. And as the opportunities to not only use this in a clinical realm, but also to take this into individual self-healing practices developed, became apparent that the word haven, to put the mind and body into a safe space, was a really powerful and apt description for what we're doing. So as we transition here, Rebecca, I just want to check in. I know you all can't see Rebecca, but she's here with me. And I'm going to open up my chat. Are there any questions coming in that would be supportive?
<laughs> no, she actually just texted me what she was going to put in the chat box. All right, I think we're good. So I'm going to continue on here. So the havening touch has been shown in the literature to be most effective when you engaged in four specific areas on the mind and body. Now these little fibers, and we do have an entire video on our YouTube channel that can go deep into the science if you're interested in learning more about the havening touch. And if I know Rebecca, she'll put that in the chat box for y'all that are actually all over our body, wherever there's hair, because you know, humans are, you know, hairy creatures ultimately. Interestingly, the fibers are also on our palms, which kind of highlights the power of touch in of itself. The first touch, and I'll invite you to model or to follow along with me as we practice these touches, is as though you're washing your hands under warm water. Do you remember at the very beginning of the pandemic when the guidelines came out to wash your hands for 20 seconds? And hopefully we were all doing that anyway. And to also sing a song so you were sure to wash your hands for the 20 seconds. As you'll learn here quickly, we were all very excited in the Havening community because that is one of the Havening touches. And that was down regulating the mind body system. The second touch is as though it's a soft, soothing hug. I like to call it a Havening hug or a moving hug. Arms crossed across your shoulders, fingers on your shoulders, and then moving down to your elbows. If you're familiar with EMDR and butterfly taps, this will be a very, very, very similar touch. The only shift being that we're engaging those fibers through the gentle, soft touch. Let me go right across the brow, as I mentioned earlier, with that tension headache. Following the eyebrows and finally wiping away tears, just wrapping right around the eyes, following your cheekbones. These touches can be used in a combination. They can be used in isolation. You can choose to only use one touch. Uh, we just did a wonderful workshop or a series of workshops with the Sexual Abuse Prevention and Response Program for the Air Force. And we talked a lot about how perhaps focusing only on palm havening with individuals who have had touch weaponized against them may be preferred when you're introducing these touches to people because that is a more common or accepted type of touch. And so as you're introducing this stuff to your clients, slow, steady invitation and discussing how this works and inviting an exploration of curiosity of what feels okay. Now, as somebody who does work with sexual trauma and complex PTSD a lot, we have of course created a whole host of alternative ways to engage these same receptors and get that same wonderful electrochemical shift that we were just talking about with the power of soothing touch in a way that feels safe for individuals who struggle with the experience of touch. And honestly, one of the greatest gifts that I've seen in my clinical practice is utilizing this process to recreate a felt sense of safe connection to touch and thus self, because touch is, again, one of our most fundamental senses. And if feeling the experience of touch has been weaponized against us, we have lost an internal sense of safety at a deep biological level. And we do have a YouTube video that Rebecca will put into the chat box that goes through all of the alternative opportunities for how to integrate these touches safely uh, but for now, we're going to transition into, okay, all of this good, powerful touch stuff and what's going on in the brain? How is this happening? Just a quick check-in. Just notice, do you like roller coasters? I found that that's one of those polarizing things for many people. You either love them or you hate them. If you love them and you're about to get on a roller coaster, your brain will go into a gamma state. If you hate it and you're about to get on a roller coaster, your brain will also go into a gamma or a hypergamma state. It's a very, very fast, rapid processing brainwave state. And it's a critical criteria for a moment of trauma to be encoded into the brain and remembered forever. It's also a critical part of what leads to the development of stress induced structural plasticity. The havening touch, on the other hand, 
down regulates the brain and creates a increased power, as we say in the field of uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback, or increased presence of these slower brain wave states. And delta specifically is a critical part of memory reconsolidation while we sleep. Well, a big part of trauma reprocessing is what? Reconsolidating memories. And so the havening touch in of itself creates a permissive state for the brain to downregulate out of that stress, out of the trauma encoding, out of that moment of trigger or alertness and move in an alternative direction, which then of course we have protocols and structures built around, which creates a whole new opportunity for how we can use these tools in our own daily lives for our own human moments and teach these tools to our clients to regulate their mind-body systems in between sessions, and even to support the system in letting go, and we'll talk about this more in just a moment, of those triggers so that they show up less often or even stop showing up at all in some cases. But first, let's do a practice so that you can experience yourself the power of neuroplasticity and the havening touch. So if you're starting to engage with self-havening for the first time, it can be helpful to have a framework. And my friend Bill Souls created this framework. And I'd like to just invite you to follow along if you want to use this or practice it, it can be supportive. You'll start with your fingertips in the center of your forehead. And then wrap around your eyes, circle up to your nose and back, out to your cheeks, down your arms, and then to your palms. Then you can repeat that motion if it's helpful. And I know sometimes for brains, it's easier to have a structure to start and then start to notice what feels most comfortable. What we've found is most people have one or two sweet spots that their system prefers. I know I definitely do a lot of palm havening. And then I also am a big fan of the havening hug, especially when my brain's starting to go, oof. It's a pretty good tell for my teams here in Los Angeles when I'm having a particularly unique day if I find myself doing this in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> and that's the cool thing about these touches is they become muscle memory. If you've ever yourself bit your nails or picked at your nails or had a client who struggled with that, that's not too different from what is trying to be accomplished here. And it becomes an easy redirect, a go-to self-soothing mechanism. Now, our brains are designed to find difficult things. And we always have glimmers of positivity surrounding us. And so I'd like to invite everybody to sit back, just find a space, welcome in a gentle breath, breathing in and out. Let's begin to apply that soothing self-havening touch, either in that order I just introduced to you or in any order that feels comfortable for you. I invite you to find either a soft gaze or to invite your eyes to gently drift close as we go on this neuroplasticity journey. Let's take a moment and slide back across the course of this day, yesterday evening, yesterday even. See if you can find a smile. And you'll notice I put some cute images up here for you as well. Just invite your mind to explore and find a smile. Now, this could be a smile that you exchanged with a loved one. Perhaps a smile on a beloved pet. I know my orange tabby cat certainly smiles. Maybe a smile that was hidden in an object, such as the curve of a coffee cup or the curve of a flower petal. 
It'd be one of those so precious, rare exchanges where you exchange a glance and a smile with a perfect stranger, having a moment of human connection. Once you've found your smile, invite it to become the center of your awareness, spotlighting it with intention, welcoming it here and now to be with you. And notice if your smile has a color or a shape. Does it have a scent? Maybe a vibrant citrus? Perhaps a soothing lavender? Welcome in a gentle breath, deepening your connection to that smile. Even imagine that you're inviting that smile in. Breathing in, two, three, four, and out, five, four, three, two, one. And as you notice your smile, notice if it has a home inside you. Do you notice a shift or a change as you connect more fully to it? Do you even perhaps feel pulled to smile back? Greeting that smile with one of your own. And noticing now if there is some place that you would like to invite that smile to anchor within your own mind and body system. A space that you can return and connect back to at any time. When we choose to spotlight something with intention, we're letting our mind and body, and particularly our amygdala, know that this matters. We're saying pay attention to more of these. We want more of this and teaching our brain to fire and wire in that direction. And as we bring this exercise to a gentle close, let's take a moment to extend gratitude to the smile, to your mind and your body, to yourself for being here today and for taking a moment to connect with this experience with intention. Our mind and our body love to feel whole, and strong and empowered. But that doesn't mean that is how our brain is wired. In fact, if you ever find that you catch yourself in a ruminating loop, guess what? Me too. Our brain is desired to Google search the hard stuff, to find it in that 10% of the present moment, prioritize it and link into it. So much so that sometimes it even takes that hard data and turns it into fact that we then act upon just as we saw with Wesley. As the extremely wise Dr. Rick Hansen reminds us, our nervous system evolved and as it evolved, survival has always trumped thriving. So our brain is designed to keep us alive. It's its number one directive. And that means looking out for the tigers in the grass. But like we talked about, we don't have a lot of tigers running around in the 21st century unless there was a zoo break. What we do have is a lot of data coming at us in a whole new way that our brain has not been designed to process. And specifically those old primal brain parts. Again, remember, there's no brain 2.0 for these more ancient brain parts. And so the more that we're exposed to stress, the more our brain looks for stress because those freeways start to say, this is what we do. This is how we stay alive. And that begins to guide what we spotlight with intention. And that becomes the automatic way that we navigate the world. Unless we take a quiet moment and pause 
and find something like a smile. If the amygdala is in a red brain state, those difficult moments can start to overwhelm. Here's the thing, Amy the amygdala, like we talked about, she is our fiercest protector. She is 300 million years old. She's been doing something right for a very long time because she's still hanging out with us and making sure that, again, we're not running in traffic, we're not falling off cliffs. And by the way, if you don't like roller coasters, that's your amygdala keeping you safe. As humans, we are not designed to strap ourselves in metal boxes and plummet at the earth at 120 to 180 miles per hour. That's a poor idea for our species. Yeah. Some of us do it. Some of us do it even without the roller coaster, just with a jet pack on our backs or a pack on our backs. So, hey, whatever works. Our amygdala is going to keep us safe. And she's going to assess for threat rapidly, four times faster than the blink of an eye. She's also critical in developing our sense of self in the world and helping us build relationships. And so when we start speaking the electrochemical language of the amygdala, and working with neuroplasticity, then we can start to create a whole new opportunity in the therapeutic space by helping the amygdala step back and harnessing the neuroplastic role of her. And also outside of session in our own daily lives, deepening our relationship to self. See, our amygdala has a fantastic memory. And remember, she's on board in the third trimester. She's one of the first nuclei in the system to start encoding information and recalling it. And it's all sensory. She speaks the language of the five senses, and then we'll throw the sixth in there, interoception. She is tuning into that experience. She is not speaking English or ASL or Mandarin or French. It's electrochemical. And if she thinks that there's a tiger in the room, just like she did for Wesley, she's going to make sure that we have a way out she is fast and she's got her go-tos that she loves fight flight freeze fawn those two d's defensive rage and dissociation she even has a specific nuclei for dissociation she is powerful in her work to keep us safe and when we're living in a high stress cortisol driven environment she gets more airtime than our self brain so we need to help her feel safe. And the more airtime she gets, the more she's pulling on that 90% of the past and prioritizing anything tied to the past to help us stay safe in the present moment. See, our amygdala plays a critical role in ultimately defining who we are in the world, how we experience ourselves. She plays a role in our cognitions. Our autonomic nervous system, so gastrointestinal considerations, rapid heartbeat, am I feeling anxious or excited? Either way, our heart rate might go up. And how we're experiencing body memories, the somatosensory world, pain. She's chiming in on all of these things. She even has a specific nuclei called the central nucleus that is tied to physiology. And of course, our emotional world. She loves emotions, the big, beautiful, vibrant ones, and she prioritizes the hard, scary ones. Those threat cues are critical. And these experiences don't stay in the past. In fact, the earliest experiences become the guiding light for how we navigate the world in our present moment. They become the priority. And this is so much of the work that we do for our clients and for ourselves is unwinding these old thoughts that hijack us into not just perhaps a behavior we'd rather not do, but also the consequential shame, the why did I, how could I, I know better, and that spiral that comes when we behave in a way that we were going, oh, why am I doing this? But we couldn't quite get our self brain to connect. Now, many, many, many years ago, I had an opportunity to work with a young man who was an aspiring artist. He was a wonderful musician. Difficulty was that he grew up in a high performing military family that did not allow space for his more creative offbeat ways. And he had a brother who was the best at all the things. 
And that brother had a lot of light shown on him. And poor Jeff did not. And Jeff's amygdala learned a lot about how he needed to stay safe in these oftentimes contradictory ways of being small, of numbing out with substances, of disconnecting from the world. Perhaps this sounds like some of your clients. Because if we are told, don't be who we are, our brain and our body will find a different way. Now, he came to therapy to start doing the work to find himself and start cultivating his new experience of the world and giving himself permission to lean in to what he loved, music. And so after one particularly rough session in the recording studio, he showed up in my office just fraught with anxiety. His amygdala was clearly running the show and had been for quite some time. Described the session as being a disaster. The recording session was going great. I could see them in the recording booth. They're nodding along to the beat. But then Jeff's legs started bouncing. His hands started balling up into tight fists. A strong somatosensory and autonomic tell that Amy was jumping on board in this moment, even though he was now here safe with me. And then what happened, Jeff? What got Amy so freaked out? I nod my head in encouragement and start gently applying the palm havening touch to my own hands, modeling a new opportunity to release that energy of his bald fists and start caring for his system. Luckily, he attuned and his palms did start gently creating that gentle touch. And then the producer shook his head. He shook his head and he left. He moved his arms into that self-soothing havening hug position, that autopilot now, weeks of work coming into play as soon as Amy went into that red brain zone. When I saw that, I just choked. Everything fell apart. I couldn't play anymore. I was paralyzed. I knew I had screwed up. I knew I couldn't do it anymore. And of course, from there, he went to his local bar and he missed his gig that night. How many times have our clients had these moments? I forgot to switch my slide. How many times have we ourselves had these moments, a reading of a situation that then our brain spirals out of control, our amygdala reminds us of something from the past and starts telling this worst case story of doom, narrating that present moment through this fear lens based on what we have learned, the case for self. How do we stay safe? So I'd like to think about the amygdala as having three core values. And when we're born, she's trying to figure these values out. How do we stay safe? How are we lovable? And how are we successful? Now, success is not the car we drive or money in the bank, although as we grow older, that's certainly helpful. Success is Maslow's fundamental hierarchy of needs. Are our basic needs being met? Do we have food and water? Is there some sort of shelter? And these values tie deeply to one another, guiding our sense of self about the world. And we start to learn that we stay safe by. Jeff learned to stay safe by shutting down his creative instinct and eventually silencing that flame inside of him. Until one day, somebody said, hey, buddy, you're really good at this. What if you actually try? And a mentor started to work with him. Sometimes it just takes one voice. But that didn't mean that his amygdala calmed down because he had learned and he had been taught that his way for success, lovability, and safety was to stay small. And staying small meant calling himself names, meant beating himself up meant silencing himself in difficult moments, not allowing himself to bloom. So he learned that if he uses his voice, if he is expressive and interacts in the world, he will be unsafe. And there were many times where his family actually kicked him out when he would go after hours and play at a gig in high school 
And then they just said, you, you're not staying here anymore. And he lived on friend's sofas for months. The very highest form of threat is being kicked out of our village. We need our village and our caregivers are that foundational village, healthy or unhealthy. As we grow and we develop, this guides the development of the case for self. And our amygdala is much like Walt Whitman highlights here. Does she contradict herself? Very well then, especially when these core values start playing a role in our adult life. Because the amygdala impact is large and it contains multitudes. The amygdala doesn't know that the past is no longer present. The amygdala is still accessing and utilizing the information from all the way back there. And so if we are taught that we are stupid, if we are told repeatedly that this is our truth, eventually our brain buys in because that's how we stay safe. That's how we have a sense of lovability, connection, and that's how we get our core needs met. met. The child will buy in. That is neuroplasticity and the developing system. Now, if it's good stuff, it's neuroplasticity. And remember, if it's painful, difficult stuff, it's that stress-induced structural plasticity. And it gets the priority processing. And our brain doesn't leave it in the past. The brain learns it and encodes it and he holds on to it, defining our frameworks for how we make sense of every moment of our life. So these two lists have some pretty high value words on them. Some of them might jump out at you a little bit more in terms of the way you experience your own life. Here's the thing about these two lists of words. We didn't come into the world with any of these words accessible to us. We learned them. We were taught what they meant and how they apply to us and the world around us through the developmental process and through neuroplasticity. So when we start to directly interact with neuroplasticity in the clinical space and in our own self-healing work, well, we can start to heal through the neural networks over here. We can even turn these moments into opportunities, a yellow flag moment where amygdala goes, whoa, 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 I'm now calling myself stupid. That's something from the past. This is an opportunity to lean in and get curious about why I'm beating myself up right now. Because that's old stuff. 99.999% of the time, it doesn't belong in the present. And instead, start to build what we want, this other side. Harnessing neuroplasticity through speaking the electrochemical language of the amygdala. Because that's where the case begins, the thalamus and the amygdala sending all of this up for a Google search of what do we know about this moment right here, right now. And depending on the super freeway that the brain jumps on, well, that's going to win our information processing moment. For Jeff, that head shake was a trigger. In session, we started looking at what happened in that moment. All he remembered was the head shake and then paralysis. And as we started zooming out, that head shake became connected to his Google search reminded him of a very similar moment when he came home and had received the news that he'd gotten a scholarship to a music academy. And his dad just looked at him and his mom just looked at him, crossed their arms and sighed in abject, tangible disappointment. Said, and why can't you be more like your brother, Tom? You're so stupid. And his brain remembered that. And when the producer shook his head and turned and walked out, that trigger, 75 milliseconds, went up to his Google search of doom. And his brain goes, oh, yeah, we know this one. We know how this story goes. We better just quit, get out, freeze, shut down because what comes next is going to hurt. 
red brain, red brain, red brain. Now what actually happened in that moment? The producer got a text message from his wife about something related to his own child, interestingly. And he had to step out to take the phone call. And he got signed that day by that music producer. And that was the launch of his career. But his brain didn't have access to that data. And instead, he almost torpedoed himself through going on a bender, missing his gig, ghosting his bandmates. And thank goodness there was a part of him that was present enough to say, I'm at least going to go to Dr. Kate's office and show up. There was something inside him that had that level of commitment because he had chosen this journey. And he was also doing his CPR for the amygdala when he woke up very hungover, realizing everything he had done and started shame spiraling. And we will learn CPR for the amygdala here in just a moment. As we can help Amy calm down and step back. And we know that that shame spiral can be just as triggering and even more negatively impactful than whatever happened in that moment because oh shame is like cotton candy for amygdala she just loves it and it will keep us paralyzed and when we're in those trigger moments we can get pushed out of what's called our window of tolerance and it could be a big trigger or even a small trigger or a series of small triggers if you've ever had that happen you wake up a little late you spill your coffee, you can't find your car keys, and the next thing you know, you're just vibrating at a slightly different space. Well, you could be out of your window of tolerance, but if we stay out of our window of tolerance for a prolonged period of time, it can start to rewire our system. The window of tolerance is where we are flexibly adapting to the world. It doesn't mean that everything's gravy by any means. Resilience isn't about gravy and great. Resilience is about flexible adaptation. So if you've ever studied, studied heart math or heart rate variability, we want our heart rate to be flexible so that we are responsive to the data of the world. We also want our brain to be flexible so we're responsive to the data of the world. But when we are outside our zone, we get stuck there. The, the cycle of anxiety and depression, the cycle of rage and dissociation, the cycle of agitation and worry. Well, we may not even cycle. We just may be up here or we may be down here. The longer we live in this space, the smaller our window can become. That's the power of stress-induced structural plasticity it actually will weaken and make smaller our zone, making it less accessible when we need it. And when we speak the language of those primal survival brain parts, we can create proactive change. So we're going to start shifting into how do we do this and learning these tools. And before we do that though, I want to check and see if there's any questions coming in that would be supportive for me to address. Uh, how do dreams connect with Amy? That's one of my favorite topics. All right. So our amygdala doesn't sleep. It would be so lovely if it did. Oh, but she doesn't. So that idea of waking up on the wrong side of the bed, very, very real. Our amygdala plays an important role in nightmares. How many times have you yourself or have you heard a client describe that they're having a delightful dream walking down the beach someplace and then the next thing they know there's a tsunami and they get crashed on and the entire scene turns dark. Well, that's our little amygdala. When an event is big enough or vibrant enough, our brain will superglue it. There's a specific type of receptor called an ampi receptor. It's a glutamate receptor onto the amygdala. And when that little receptor gets lit up, it's too powerful for our sleep processes to do a general reconsolidation as it would with a regular memory, because our brain has now tagged it and said, okay, this is scary stuff. We're going to remember it. Again, great news when it comes to a hot stove. 
not so great news when it comes to a experience of a certain facial expression in our childhood representing harm because our brain remembers that facial expression just as vibrantly as it would a hot stove. And those glued on receptors play a role in how we sleep and our information processing while we sleep. And there's another question. Can you clarify trimester like the other things touch an amygdala? So in the first trimester, the first three months in utero is where the sense of touch develops. And then the amygdala is formed in the third trimester, which means that before we're even breathing air, we have a part of our system that's back there making sense of the world around us. All right, I'm going to go a little bit further and then don't worry, we'll take a quick break here because I know three hours is quite a long time for everybody to sit. But let's talk about the first of the protocols that we'll be learning today. And this protocol has a couple different tools woven into it from the Healing in Your Hands book. And I'll be kind of touching on how those work because what we want to be doing is participating or is intentionally getting our prefrontal cortex to participate in the moment as much as possible, whether that be in the moment of the actual trigger or in a moment where our brain has hijacked us and we're now after the fact going, oh, there's some consequences such as Jeff coming into my office in that shame spiral and Wesley after that experience with his supervisor. CPR for the amygdala is one of the foundational self-havening protocols and it stands for creating personal resilience. The idea is that we're empowering the amygdala to come back online after a red brain moment. So CPR, most of us are familiar with and several, I'm sure a lot of us are probably certified, we, what do we do and when do we do that? When we cannot breathe, when our body is not capable of functioning. We do CPR for the amygdala when our brain is feeling like it cannot function the way we want it to. When we're that in that red brain survival threat focus space, which is how come it's called this. CPR for the amygdala, give the amygdala some love, let her know that we actually have everything we need, that there isn't a threat right now. Because when she's in vibrant red, she thinks that something is going to hurt us or even possibly kill us. CPR for the amygdala creates agency. It's a tool in your pocket, in your client's pocket, because life happens. We're taking in sensory data all the time. And in a moment where life happens and our amygdala goes, uh oh, I don't like that. Well, we have a tool in your pocket to bring yourself down so you don't stay outside your zone. And because we're speaking the language of the amygdala, it also is proactively working as a glue be gone for whatever got triggered in that moment, which is extremely exciting. In the clinical space, we can use a different version of this to actually heal those super glue moments of trauma. Here, we're empowering our clients in their day-to-day -day life to notice sensory moments of triggers, opportunities, what used to be called a yellow flag that their brain's going, I don't know, that could trip them into a red brain zone. They can now wait, oh, I've got a tool for this and let me lean in and get curious. As Dan Siegel reminds us, we want to feel it to heal it. And here we're saying, here's a tool so that when you feel it, you can heal your brain which is one of the most empowering things that we can give to our clients and for ourselves, because it feels pretty cool to notice when our brain goes, oh, okay, I got this. That's pretty cool. So the protocol is quite simple because remember, our ancient brain is pretty simple. It's been roaming around this fair planet of ours for 300 million years before humans even were. So we have this acronym that we've come up with called SNAP. We're going to snap the amygdala out of the red brain so that she can move into the yellow or green brain. Because the yellow brain zone is a good zone. There's some space for consideration. So SNAP stands for first sensing into it. And I'll go in a little more in depth in all of these steps. Then we're going to notice that something's happening. Uh, many of us might be familiar with the subjective units of distress scale. Uh, we use a slight modification on that. Well, I'll introduce that in just a moment. 
and we apply that soothing havening touch wrapping a warm fuzzy blanket of oxytocin and GABA and serotonin around our system so that we can go who we don't need to stay in that gamma hyper firing cortisol state anymore and then we're going to give our brain a different job because left to its own devices, our amygdala and our working memory system, which is our Google system in our brain, will guide our information processing. And so we want to stop that feedback loop so they cannot keep gossiping and sourcing up all of the related difficult moments of our lives. And yes, this might you might have just noticed, this is what rumination is. It's that Google search that is driven by the amygdala. So in that moment for Jeff, had he had the opportunity to push pause, put the guitar down and check in with the sound booth, the recording studio. And so, hey, I noticed the producer left and sense into the fact that something just got highly triggered. He could have shifted his experience in that moment. So we're sensing into the fact that, yeah, I am definitely in a red brain zone right now feeling it to heal it then we're noticing the notice is important because it's bringing that prefrontal cortex online with intention just as when i asked you to blink and you spotlighted that information and perhaps even blinked that anterior cingulate gyrus is going notice this right now sensing noticing that's prefrontal cortex activity that's good stuff we like that then we're applying that soothing havening touch that warm fuzzy blanket of calm and giving our working memory a different job now for those of you who are cbt people or mindfulness practitioners this is going to sound very familiar we are distracting the system and that can be through brain games it can be through different types of mindful exercises finding different colors in the space counting steps doing number sequences with breath work we're simply saying hey brain you need to do something different now and i'll unpack how to create a safe inventory here in just a moment this then starts to soften and pull back that red brain zone because Amy and the working memory are no longer gossiping. They're no longer chatting with one another. And instead, the brain is going, ah, electrochemical safety because of that havening touch. That redirect to a distraction. And then the system can come back to self. And because it's sensory driven, we know that it could be in the moment of a trigger or in any of those lingering case elements those cognitions if we're ruminating emotions somatosensory rapid heartbeats sweaty palms anything tied to a trigger and the encoding of a trigger and the more we utilize this protocol the more we're delinking the likelihood that that particular trigger could show up again and it could be a scent, an eyebrow, whatever it is that the amygdala goes, oh, uh -oh I don't like that, that then gets priority processing. So we're snapping, sensing something's awry. And when the amygdala is guiding the show, the anterior cingulate gyrus and the prefrontal cortex then are going off of the amygdala's feedback loop, prioritizing that. Now, for those of you who are EMDR trained, you know your negative cognitions and your positive cognitions. This is that concept. The negative is that spotlighting. And when we look at the fMRIs of EMDR, that's a large part of where we see functional changes is in that anterior cingulate gyrus, which is where the opportunity to integrate havening as a powerful amygdala engaging tool is awesome. So we're working with so many different brain parts, the more we integrate these components together. Same with our prefrontal cortex work. The more we can support the neurobiology and being engaged and present in the integration, the greater the healing opportunity across the board. So first we're just sensing something's wrong. The good news about sensing and noticing 
is that the more we start to expand our language around emotions, as well as the energetic activation of our system in any moment, the more we're teaching our brain that it's not all one thing or another. So often our patients have maybe five primary emotions. They're sad, they're angry, they're numb. And well, sometimes that's all it is. And then that ever elusive search for happiness. We really need to have all of the emotions available to us because they're critical data points, even the difficult ones. And so in using what we call the emotions thermometer, you can start to shift your awareness and help your clients become more intentionally attuned to the fact that, wait a minute, we can be at a five and have our brain percolating around something, but that doesn't mean we're going to be hijacked. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, and we go deeper into this in the book, we can be at a five and give that energy a different job. What used to be anxious can become excited because physiologically they're not too different. But the label, the case, plays a critical role. So sensing into it, noticing it is really, really important. And then we're going to apply that havening touch, give our mind and our body the opportunity to downregulate and start to shift into our zone, that green brain space, or even just the yellow brain. As you'll notice, yellow brain here, okay, I'm feeling uncomfortable, but I'm not out of control. I can be in distress and be okay. I can be upset and reconnect to my smile. I invite you all to take a moment and reconnect to your smile and notice if it's there. The power of the spotlight with intention. Neuroplasticity is so cool. Our brain is so malleable when we know how to speak the language of it. If we calm the system down and then finally preoccupy. Now, distractions are a really exciting opportunity to bring into your own clinical practice as well as to get to know yourself better. So we, we, we always create a distraction inventory in our very first session. And one of the reasons I love to do it and my teams and I do it in our first session is because our clients frequently show up with this framework of we're here to talk about the hard stuff. Well, when we start building a distraction inventory, we're also learning about the things that they enjoy. What do they like? What are their hobbies? What are areas of expertise that we might not otherwise hear about in a therapeutic space? Because the distractions are all about their and your own unique brain and giving the brain a different data point to attune to. It can be as simple as breath work and we'll practice an exercise in just a moment. Or it could be as lovingly in depth as I work with a lot of um, horseback riders and I'm an equine certified equine psychotherapist and working with horses and having them describe the process of putting the halter on the horse and grooming the horse and counting the strokes as they're brushing or cleaning the hooves and noticing what that feels like. You see, our working memory system is also very sensory based. It speaks the language of the senses as well. And to give you an example of this, take a moment and imagine that you're holding a basketball. And if you've never held a basketball, find a ball that you've held in your life. <laughs> and then imagine bouncing or dribbling that basketball five times. Notice your sensory experience. And then perhaps even imagine shooting a basket and go free throw, granny shot, whatever you like. To kind of feel like that's happening. And for an even more vibrant representation, find a hobby or something that you thoroughly enjoy. Anything from cross stitch to yoga to hiking. If you're a cook, making your favorite recipe. All of those experiences will start to help the working memory link to the sensory elements, distracting it from the red brain moment. But while distractions have been scientifically proven to downregulate the brain while we're using them, 
It is not a sustained down regulation. It's the addition of the havening touch that creates the sustained change and those outcomes that we witness of the sustained decrease in blood pressure, cortisol, so on and so forth. So it's the combo platter of the two. So let's do a quick practice and then we are going to go and take a small break before we come back and transition into the opportunities of building and healing, a building with neuroplasticity. So breath, breath is a very, very powerful thing as we know. In fact, we need it to live. It's critical for our survival. We can incorporate breath as a great tool for healing. And you may have had clients in your life who have struggled with breath work. When we live in states of tension and stress, our breathing patterns foundationally change, especially prolonged tension and stress. And I don't know if you're like me, but remember when the Apple watch used to tell you to breathe all the time? Now I believe it's called having a take a mindful moment. I loved when it said breathe because my little orienting reflex, my spotlight would go, oh yeah, breathe because I tend to hold my breath. And breathing is very, very, very important for regulating the brain and the body. But if breath work in of itself causes anxiety for your clients or for yourself, that's because your amygdala is working very, very hard to keep you safe. She's diligently ensuring that your nervous system stays in a yellow or red brain, probably more of a yellow or perhaps a green yellow state, just in case a threat happens to show up. Because again, the amygdala loves us and she wants to keep us safe. So we can start to recreate a safe connection to breath work through the incorporation of that CPR for the amygdala. And if we're using breath work with CPR for the amygdala, I want to provide a tiny piece of data to keep in mind. For individuals who've been living in a vigilant or hypervigilant state, feeling calm can be very triggering. There's even a name for this. It's called relaxation-induced anxiety. Relaxation-induced anxiety is that rebound effect of our brain going, oh, I feel quiet, and the amygdala going, oh, no, it's not okay to be quiet because my case for the world around me is that I need to be on guard. Sound familiar to anybody? Anybody else struggle with meditation? I struggled with meditation forever until I could start bringing in, until I learned about the havening touch. When we struggle to connect to our mind and body system, when our bodies and our minds have learned even that our physiology is dangerous to us, we will disconnect. And becoming calm, attuning inward can create a lot of anxiety and stress. So in that situation, moving into breath work in a specific way can be very, very supportive. And that's why I love this specific side breath exercise. Because for any of you breath holders out there, do you sigh a lot? I do. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a joke here in the hallways of our clinic. Uh, you can tell what kind of day I'm having by A, if I do this at some point during the day, and B, how heavy are my sighs? Because I hold my breath. Doesn't mean I'm stressed all the time, but I am, you might be able to tell, pretty energetic and a little type A. Type A in a good way, still. It, sh it shines through. So the Psy Breath exercise was created by Andrew Huber Huberman and Dr. Feldman. Andrew Huberman's up at Stanford. If you're not familiar with his work, he's a phenomenal neuroscientist, has an incredible podcast. Dr. Feldman's one of the world's foremost experts on breath. He's here at UCLA. And together they, in conversation, discussed and realized that, wait a minute, the sighing is an important part of our physiological reset for our breath. We sigh because it fills our lungs with the really delightful oxygen and that heavy release of a sigh gets rid of what's technically poison, the carbon dioxide. 
So the sigh breath in of itself, and I'll guide you through a, a quick practice, and then we'll do a larger exercise with the havening touch when we come back from break, empowers us to incorporate these two things. The sigh breath exercise in of itself is a double breath in and then a slow release. Now, what does that look like? I'm going to use my hand as a gauge, so I'll invite you to breathe in. Then you're breathing in on top of that first breath. And then a slow, gentle release. And everybody's on mute. So if there's nobody around you, and if you even want to, you can make that <sighs> sound. It will actually up the impact. So we're breathing in, breathing in again, all that delicious oxygen. Oh. Release. Our amygdala loves to know we can breathe. Remember, that's one of our primary directives, making sure we stay alive. And obviously, oxygen is critical to that. So as soon as we come into the world and we let out our first holler as an infant, she goes, oxygen, I like this. <laughs> and she learns that just like you don't touch a hot stove. And hey, maybe you love cotton candy or roller coasters. She learns that she likes oxygen. But our physiology can reset itself so that we don't have the oxygen we need sometimes. So this is a very simple opportunity to find a rhythm, to start to expand your diaphragm and retrain it. And when we get back from break, we'll talk about how we can bring in the havening touch to start to create and cultivate a sense of safety back into the body, especially if that's been taken from us. So before we go to break, and then once again, turn over to our questions. Rebecca, anything for me to answer? I can see you're very busy over there. All right. How does one deal with an imagined worried feeling or a serious gut feel of a problem issue? Oh, that's beautiful. Um, actually, where are we in time? You know what? I'm going to... Read, read through these questions while everybody goes to break and then we'll we'll circle back and i'll answer these questions when we get back because i just realized we're at 90 minutes and uh you know zoom brains a thing and also biology is a thing so we'll take a break let's come back at 20 till the hour so it's a short break about eight minutes stretch fill your water take care of your mind and body and we'll get started again uh, right at 20 till so I'll see everybody back here shortly and we will go through these questions and then move into our guided practice.
Okay. Back into our screen here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Full disclosure, I, I've had the flu. So um, bear with me if my, my throat's a little rough. Okay, so let's look at some of these questions. Um, remember, can everybody see me okay? Tavi, are you here with us? Yeah? Yep, you're all good. Okay, perfect. All right, so. <clears throat> um, okay, so dealing with an imagined worry feeling or a serious gut feel. That goes back to the 90% the of this moment being defined by things that have happened in the past, as well as our own, what we call interoception around something, that, that sixth sense that something's off. Our system is designed to intuit when things feel awry and it's supportive, it's there to keep us alive. If you ever felt kind of the hair show up on the back of your uh, neck a little bit, that's exactly what that is. Uh, same reason why if you've ever smelled something rotten, you've been like, ooh. And we're born with certain things that we're inherently afraid of, I uh, call unconditioned threat stimuli. Basically things that have killed enough of our species across the course of our lives that our brain's like, I'm gonna tie that into our next evolutionary step. So if it's one of those types of experiences, then still creating a space to calm the brain down, but also recognizing that that's a yellow flag moment. And in the book, we do have an entire exercise designed around how to work with yellow flags that's outside the space of our context today. But the idea being that if we go back to that emotions thermometer, our brain is saying, pay attention to this. And then we want to make sure that our nervous system and our clients' nervous systems have the space to not go into that reactionary mode, the getting up and leaving and slamming the door after saying something less than preferable to his boss that Wesley did, or the complete freeze shutdown that poor Jeff experienced, followed by the compensatory binge drinking. We want to help the system have that space. Because intuition is one of the superpowers of being human. It's a gift. And it could be tied to an experience we've had in the past or it could be tied to one of those unconditioned threats to me life. Uh, the next question is, so if Amy is active continuously, even in sleep dreams and waking hours, is she responsible for waking thoughts, fears, and confirmations of our imagination? Or is it all about our past fears? Amy's playing a role in how <clears throat> our mind and body are making sense of the world around us. Those case elements, our cognitions, our autonomic, our somatosensory, our emotional world, based on the experiences of our past, those unconditioned threat stimuli. So is she responsible for them? If they are those threat or survival focused experiences. And in some of our other trainings, we go more deeply into this idea that when the brain has a case for survival or a case for trauma. But yes, she plays a role in deciding which ways of information processing is our brain getting on. Again, check back in with your smile. She's playing a role in that too. That's why we call her a fierce maternal protector. She's a warrior on our behalf. And we want to support her plus our thalamus in going in specific directions that are more in alignment with how we want our mind body functioning in a given moment, rather than those fears and worries. And it could be factual or it could be also imaginal. So what if stories of doom, right? And we'll learn a protocol that I came up with way back. You originally started using it with EMDR long before Havening was even on my radar called the Creating Possibilities Protocol, where we're going to give what ifs a different job because our brain will what if itself. It's like a doomy, doomy gloomy narrator. If you remember those choose your own adventure stories, if left to its own devices and it's tied to difficult things. We can use that and give and use it to harness neuroplasticity to build the brain we want to live within, which is great. Ah, havening and grief. Okay, this is uh, obviously very, we're actually going to have a case study here in a moment about grief. Uh, obviously something very near and dear to my heart. That's one of my areas of specialization as well. That it, it's, it's beautiful, complicated, powerful, and incredible work. Grief is uh, really nuanced. 
On the YouTube channel, we have a number of educational videos as well as guided exercises for how to integrate havening into grief work. And so I do, I'm going to recommend that you go check those out because the, it's very, very finely nuanced. Uh, there's also a great book that just came out called The, Gr the Grieving Brain or The Grief Brain. I should know this because I cited it extensively in my second book that's coming out next year. Um, the Grieving Brain, Rebecca, yeah. Mary, 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 uh, shoot, I've got Zoom brain myself, sorry y'all. Um, phenomenal book on the neurobiology group. So check that out if you haven't read it and she's an incredible, incredible author. Um, working with veterans and complex PTSD, how would you frame these techniques such as the distractions so that you're not reinforcing avoidance? Is it simply coming back to triggering events after you have calmed yourself down with havening? That's such a great question. And we've been very lucky to um, run trainings and teach this uh, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, as well as, as I mentioned, partner with the Air Force Sexual Abuse Prevention and Response Program. When we're teaching this, especially in some of those more institutionalized settings where uh, there's a little more of a concrete focus on specific types of interventions. We really like to lead with the neuroscience, and that's true across the board for any trauma survivors. As the more we understand that the brain's being a brain, that in of itself softens the trauma. And when we can talk about this narrating gossiping loop and how normal that is for all of our brains, and also talk about the fact that we can intentionally redirect our brain and help it calm down by playing brain games and applying the havening touch. That is very, very powerful for people to learn about. That doesn't mean that we're not going to circle back to what the trigger was or what was happening in that moment, but we're allowing the system to safely move into whatever happened rather than and have a prefrontal cortex engagement Again, going back to that emotions thermometer, ideally a five or below. Something's happening. I may not like it, but my thinking brain is here. And we can keep utilizing the CPR to downregulate the system in those types of experiences. Because we know with complex PTSD, there's a specific neurobiology happening. And the amygdala is going to keep pushing us up. And not just with complex PTSD, but so many different types and considerations that we work with. So that emotions thermometer for us is a mainstay of our clinical toolkit. It's helping the patients recognize when they're at a five that they can bring themselves down. If they're at a five or above, we're not going to continue the content conversation because we're telling the brain spotlight this data in a threat-based state. The more we interact with the world in a red brain zone, the more amygdala is building deeper neural freeways we talk about a trauma net and a trauma filter. This is exactly that. So we want to calm down first and then revisit whatever the process is. And then if the nervous system goes back up, commit because Amy's like, ah, good. okay, calm back down. That's one of the really powerful opportunities of these tools. And modeling that in your clinical practice will help your clients start to take this organically into their day-to-day -day lives. Yes, Mary Frances O'Connor, thank you very much. That was, she's amazing. Uh, I'm a little bit of a fangirl about her, so she's great. Um, I'm loving all these questions coming in. So I'm gonna, I will answer a couple more. Does Havening Touch work with autoimmune diseases? Um, absolutely, we use the Havening Touch with chronic pain and chronic illness. That's another area of specialization um, for us here on our team. In fact, the amygdala is deeply tied into chronic pain as well as chronic illness. And there's a, something called the fear avoidance model of pain that plays out in, all, in chronic pain and illness. And on the YouTube channel, there's uh, several, there's a playlist tied to those experiences called Thriving Through Pain. So check that out. You'll get a whole bunch of yummy neurobiology stuff, as well as, of course, Haven and Guided Exercises. Um, bring in, let's see. Uh, patients who bring resistance to working this way, they don't want a new kind of therapy. They want to talk and not get educated. They don't think distraction is therapy enough. Ah, yes, yes, we have witnessed this ourselves. And that is where the neurobiology, again, is helpful. And then when we can anchor it back to their own story, those red brain zones, so it's like with Wesley or with Jeff, and this is one of the reasons I wrote the book too, 
is this exact type of acknowledgement of, yeah, we've been trained to do talk therapy. I can tell you as a psychologist, I was largely trained to do talk therapy. I was lucky enough to have a mentor in my undergrad or my graduate school who would sponsored me to do EMDR and learn EMDR. Uh, but the rest of my cohort didn't learn EMDR. This was back in the early 2000s. So I'm dating myself all over the place. That's okay. I love our field because being older is actually a good thing. Um, and so it's going to take some re-education for them and for us, to be honest. It's going to also request that we don't go into the content that the client is sharing or the narrative of the trauma or the trigger at the time and instead step back and redirect to the distractions and the CPR for the amygdala in order to not re-traumatize or strengthen the trigger. So it's, it's re-education for the clients and for us as well. And that's the power of the, what's happening in the field of neuroscience. And I always feel like I'm probably, you know, still three years behind the field of neuroscience because there every day there's more and more data coming out. But for so many of us, when we went to graduate school, we didn't have a lot of neuroscience backing. I did because I specialized in it. Most of us didn't. And so this is a lot of new information. And that's where incorporating this information into the discussion or sharing our YouTube videos uh, opens up a new opportunity. All right, um, if they are spoken to in your breathing voice quality, they feel seduced or being treated. <laughs> That's a good point. I also am recovering from the flu, uh, but I do have a, um, an alto voice for sure. I'm not usually breathy as my team would say, or if you follow me on social media, you might notice that. Um, but that you're, you're noticing their amygdala's core values, the case for self. Each of our clients are coming into the moment with their experiences of the past. Remember that cartoon with the little boy. These things are carried forward with them all the way down to, you bring up such an important point in this question or this highlighting, the tone of voice that somebody interacts with us with. Tone of voice is important. All of those safe, lovability, success elements for some people are soothing, for others are triggering, and it is completely a dance. And that's why all of this work is an experience about being client-centered first and foremost. First and foremost. I just noticed in the, something in the chat. Uh, is there a problem, Dr. Truett's age? That's sweet. I, I appreciate you picking that up. And it could be an LA issue. I think you're also noticing a little bit of my own case for self elements around what was prioritized in my own family system. See, we give ourselves away all the time, consciously and unconsciously. And so, yeah. And I did correct myself. I also appreciate you connecting that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Those little nuances, we, we share so much unintentionally. And the more we deepen ourselves into a state of awareness and connection, and also realize that even in those moments that it's our amygdala and what's been learned and taught, it's not self doing something wrong. It's going, oh, wow, that's a good data point. Thank you for teaching me something about myself that I wasn't aware of. That's awesome because now we can create space for change. So I'm going to take us, oh, there was a couple of things I wanted to quickly highlight. There's been a lot of questions about um, using the resources. All of these materials are in the Healing in Your Hands book. And if you purchase the book, you'll actually have access to the handouts. And you'll get a specific link inside the book that will take you to those materials. And so if you'd like to use them, please do cite them and attribute them. We love that. I and mean, of course, it's copyright, so do that anyway. Um, and also you're welcome to reach out to us and, um, our, the emails info at drtruitt.com. If there are specific handouts that you would like to use now, my poor office manager, it might just kind of fall over with what I just did to her there. Um, so it might take some time for her to respond, but just know that all of these things are in the book. If it is in the book, she is just going to reply and say, buy the book because then you can use it. So if that's going to be your question, uh, don't reach out to her, get the book and you can use it because Pessy's done an amazing job putting all of these handouts and these materials together. Um, 
And then you also have a lot of these, this information on the YouTube channel and then also on the, the TikTok channel and on the Instagram, you know, social media these days, it's what we do. Um, also, we know there's a lot of you and a lot of great questions coming in. Remember to upvote. Rebecca's doing her best, but I can also see she's working very, 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 very hard. And so if your question gets missed, it's not personal, it's not intentional. There's just a lot coming at her. So please remember to upvote if there's certain questions that you would really like uh, to be um, brought forward so that we can answer it here in the Q&A. All right, without further ado, I am going to bring us back to our share screen. So let's now practice a CPR for the amygdala exercise that utilizes that breathe in, breathe in, breathe out experience that we just practiced, plus the havening touch. Again, the idea being that this creates a new sense of psychological safety for our mind and body system that allows us to start to intentionally shift and deepen our awareness with ourselves without accidentally creating that connection to a felt sense of, oh, no, I don't feel safe being calm. Or if we have learned to breathe in a more shallow manner, accidentally engaging and causing some increased anxiety. So the exercise itself is exactly this. We're going to practice breathing in breathing in and then breathing out. And I have some images that I'll walk us through. And then as we're doing that, we will be applying the havening touch the entire time. Now I'd like to invite everybody to start with a simple check-in to your mind-body system and notice how you feel right here, right now. We're sensing in that first part of the CPR protocol sense in and now on the emotions thermometer just take a note of where you rank on this scale we're working with what we call our state or ambient energy in the moment there might be a little bit of brain fog you might notice you've been sitting for a little while just checking in and noticing how you're feeling right here, right now. I'll invite you to begin to apply that soothing, havening touch. Palms, arms, and face in any order. Welcoming the system to start exploring the possibility of a new electrochemical shift. Now, we're going to practice that side breath. It's as though we're breathing, we're going to smell a flower, smell a flower, and then blow some bubbles. And if you work with kiddos or teens or adolescents, that might be a familiar analogy for you. We're smelling flowers, smelling flowers, and blowing bubbles as the whole time we're continuing that havening touch. Let's breathe in, breathe in, and release. Breathing in, breathing in, and release. Breathing in, breathing in, and release. Breathing in, breathing in, and release. And one more. Oh, not one more. Okay, coming back to this present moment. Apologies for that. Just invite yourself to turn inward once again. And let's check back in on that emotions thermometer and notice if anything has shifted or changed and how you're feeling now. It's a very simple version of the creating personal resilience for the amygdala journey. 
but it's creating space for two critical elements, oxygen, as well as soothing the brain. And I'm going to actually, I just had a thought come to mind and Tabby, if you could answer this in the chat box. If I send these handouts, can we post them with the slides? So I'm happy to give an actual printable version of the handouts from this workshop if that's PESI approved, just if you could let us know in the chat box, then um, I will send those over once the workshop's done. Very happy to do that. We're extremely shareware. Uh, again, as long as the citations are on and the book citations on there already. Okay, I see that was a good, okay, that, that, that got some hits. <laughs> All right. So Tavi, I will send those over to you. Um, and then they will go wherever the slides are. All right. So we've been talking a lot about how perfect. Tavi said yes, y'all. Yay, PESI. Woo -hoo! I love PESI. This is one of my favorite organizations to work with. They are so great and so generous in everything that we do together. So we've been talking a lot about how do we help Amy calm down? And the opportunity of working with self-havening, the havening techniques and neuroplasticity is not just that we're helping to heal the past. We're creating space in the present moment as hopefully you just experienced a little bit with that side breath exercise. And we're also empowering ourselves and our clients to build the future we want to have to create in often cases the what should have been but wasn't because of the pain that was experienced in their childhood and the way those core values came into being to curate the present moment. There was a question about grief not too long ago, and this is an area of specialization of mine and really exciting space to do powerful work, especially in holding space for the sweet of what was and healing through and navigating and releasing the bitterness of loss. I personally don't believe that grieving ever comes to an end. And as a widow, I'm living in my 13th year of grief. And I also know it softens. And when we can lean in with strength and wisdom and harness the power and the opportunity of what was, it can fundamentally shift so many other elements of our life. And that can be very hard to access in a moment of grief or when we're living in the despair of grief. Sandra came to me after having been a widow for over 30 years. She had just moved to LA with her daughter and she had spent the previous 30 years highly, highly dedicated to ensuring the safety of her daughter and her adult daughter's now family and grandchild. And when her daughter moved to LA, you can bet she packed up, sold her house and followed their family here because that was how she had started to define her life. But it wasn't in a space of only loving maternal guidance. It was also grounded in the very heartbreaking experience of losing her husband when her daughter was but five years old and her fear that something like that could happen again. And by her, yes, I mean the grieving Sandra. I also mean deeply, deeply the traumatized Amy that was living within her, striving to keep her safe and grounded in the world. She'd gotten to a point, because stress impacts not just the brain, it also impacts the body, that her world had started to become defined by it she had severe IBS, tension headaches, TMJ, so grinding of the teeth at night. She wasn't sleeping well. She was going to physical therapy twice a week now just because of the severity of the muscle tension. Her traumatic experience almost 30 years prior had not just rewired her brain. Over the course of time, it had rewired her body. And when we work with the amygdala, remember, autonomic and somatosensory, all of that's part of the case. So we're able to start to shift and create a different relationship with the self. But it wasn't just about healing the past because her brain and her body didn't have the opportunity or know where to go from here. 
And so after we'd been working together for a while, there was a really amazing session where Sandra came into my office and she shared with me that she wanted to consider the possibility of dating again. I could tell she had chosen her words carefully, consider the possibility. Hmm. Amy's thinking about it, but not quite on board with this new experience. It's time, Dr. Kate, she shared with me. I caught a shy smile flicker across her face, even though she tried to hide it with her water bottle. I could imagine Amy spinning Sandra's worst case stories of doom. She had already been devastated once in her life and spent over 30 years trying to climb out of the desperately painful hole of despair. Sandra, I leaned in. I changed. She glanced down at her hands and began to pick out a nail and then caught herself and quickly reversed that old nervous habit by self-havening on her palms. She brought her eyes back to mine as she said, I met the most handsome man at a coffee shop. I even flirted a little bit. But then she stopped and her eyes darted away from mine. I felt really guilty. But also, oddly, for the first time, a little hopeful. For Sandra, the possibility of dating again and building a loving relationship with another human was filled with excitement. For Sandra's amygdala, on the other hand, it triggered the expectation of being thrown off a cliff into devastation and loss. Sandra's arms had clasped tightly across her chest as soon as she started sharing with me about feeling guilty. I knew her brain could use a little extra support and especially her amygdala. Modeling her posture, I encouraged her to gently soften that punch. Sandra, even now, Amy is trying to keep you safe. I slowly released my clasped arms and began self-havening a gentle moving hug up and down my arms. Now, if we were to focus on one feeling that would help Amy be willing to lean into the possibility of possibly dating, what feeling would that be? Sandra shared with me that she would like to feel brave, but she didn't know how. I'm starting to be brave again in so many areas of my life, but when I think about opening up my heart again, she said, there's a hollowness inside of me and I can feel Amy. She's threatening to take over. This is definitely yellow brain stuff. Well, let's start with exploring into this new possibility with some curiosity. You shared you've been doing brave things. We can use that. Let's anchor into it. Now on a scale of zero to hundred where zero is not brave at all and a hundred is completely brave like riding on the back of a bear through the forest brave. Where would you rate yourself right now? Sandra laughed at the reference to her granddaughter's favorite movie, Brave. With her arms still clasped, but more lightly now, and even beginning a little bit of the havening patch, she replied, 65%? Is that enough? Yes, that is enough. It's 65% of you is open to the possibility. 65% of Amy believes that there could be a new opportunity here, and that is plenty. Let's talk now about how we can start to cultivate and curate these experiences to help the system link into and connect to what we really want for ourselves and for our clients, to help the brain realize that we don't need to be stuck in this red brain space. Because even if we're able to regulate into our window of tolerance, that doesn't mean that all of these emotional states are available to us. We might still have a really small vocabulary around language or the possibilities of certain emotions might feel like ugh, whispers. Difficult to ask access, but possibly there. We call the possibility of possibilities. And that's where this next protocol came from, is acknowledging that we can start to cultivate and teach 
the connections and teaching the brain the connections to all of these emotional states through the incorporation of that havening touch, the electrochemical experience of safety. Because feeling brave can feel like a stretch for some of us. For others, feeling brave can feel downright impossible especially when our amygdala is running the show in a threat state. You might be familiar with that idea of toxic positivity. We just kind of latch onto an affirmation and run with it. Well, if you've ever tried to talk yourself into an affirmation, you know what I'm talking about. If our amygdala is not on board, it's not going to feel real. Even worse, if our amygdala is not on board, she'll send us into a red brain zone or sometimes kindly just into a yellow brain zone we want to help her connect in safely and in a way buy in to this new possibility creating a new neurological framework now merida from brave and i know i don't have a scottish accent so i did not say that correctly if you're familiar with the movie she is this fiery, fiery little girl who has a vision of her life, how she wants it to be. And these loving parents who are doing everything in their power to keep her safe. And it was one of Sandra's favorite movies and her granddaughter's favorite movies. And they watched it all the time. And so we were able to link into that energy and utilize the havening touch to create a new what if possibility that becomes building blocks to the new way of being. Connecting the system's internal and authentic resources, the sensory elements that our amygdala and our working memory love so much, and giving all of that a positively focused job. Brave. What if I were brave? Well, our brain loves to answer questions like we talked about a moment ago, and it will answer those questions in a very heavily focused doom and gloom way because of the negativity bias. That's just part of how our system functions for better or for worse. But when we shine the spotlight on the possibility of what we want, we get acetylcholine going, we get dopamine going, we get curiosity going. Our brain also loves to be right. Now that's kind of a less than preferable experience when we get a negativity bias tied with a confirmation bias. But when we spotlight positive or desirable or even feelings of calm, which is another great experience we can start to navigate and link into, our brain will also want to be right around the possibilities of that. This is the beauty again of these old brain pipes. They flow, data and processing. So what if I were brave? Gets that Google search going in the brain, asking that question. What if? What if? And the more expansive we can be with that question, what if? What if I were? What if I were brave? Changing the intonation, almost cartoonish. The brain's going to start Google searching other opportunities. Sandra had been doing a lot of very brave things as she highlighted. And that gave us the opportunity to help her brain remember that and further link into it through that new electrochemical space and created by the havening touch because when we have extra serotonin on board GABA on board oxytocin on board our system will link into where it's going that's a part of the havening touch journey and with the decreased cortisol decreased norepinephrine we can more we can we can gently and more Soothingly, that is not proper English. Help the system guide in the direction that we want that feels safe and secure. Ultimately, helping our clients build this internal sense that they want, that they have identified, either in the clinical room or in their own day to day lives, which also means in your day to day lives. This is all to be brought back to your world, too. The Creating Possibilities Protocol is all about harnessing the opportunities of neuroplasticity to build new freeways. But we start with pathways, and then we use the havening touch plus specific sequences of these inquiries and mental rehearsal to say, hey, brain, prioritize this. 
prioritize it, prioritize it. Until the brain and that learns and the thalamus and the amygdala go, yes, I've got this. This is real now. So our amygdala may be running around the world feeling like this poor guy. A little freaked out. He's getting yelled at a lot. And the opportunity is to start to shift and say, hey, nice to meet you, alternative feeling state. How are you today? It's been a while or maybe never. I would like to see what this feels like. Let's dip our toes into these waters. And from there, transitioning to a new way of being. Linking this in at a neurological level so that it stops being just a path and becomes a new freeway. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And we can do that with intention. So the goal is harnessing neuroplasticity. Again, I originally created this protocol all the way back in the early 2010s uh, when I was doing a lot of EMDR work. And I was working with an 11 year old girl who had very, very severe anorexia. And the possibility of anything different for her wasn't available to her brain. If you know anything about anorexia, there's a lot of specific nuances that come in term with the impact on information processing. And at 11 years old, she'd already been struggling since she was eight. She was in the hospital of being refed when I started my work with her. I got to go on an incredible journey with her in her healing space. And this protocol was a game changer because no matter what the doctors told her, no matter what work we would try to link into therapeutically, her brain was concrete and that this is her forever world. It's from the age of eight, this had been her forever world. But we could start leaning into the possibility of possibilities and exploring hypothetical what ifs and utilizing butterfly taps back then for her system to start to go, huh, oh, okay. And now deepening that with the havening touch and bringing the system even more fully into the electrochemical state to make this more accessible. So it's this gradual stepwise process. And we want to be mindful to use it when Amy is feeling somewhat safe and secure. So if Amy's in a red brain zone and we go, hey, Amy, how do you feel about bravery? If I'd said to Sandra, right when we started working together, hey, have you thought about getting on a dating app? What do you think her response would have been? No, she would have felt horribly missed to begin with by her psychologist, horribly, horribly missed. And her little amygdala would have absolutely had no space for that at all. And it probably could have triggered her pretty severely. So we want the brain calm or reasonably present calm. So sometimes we it's preferable to start CPR for the amygdala prior or other regulating techniques. So we know there's so many out there prior to moving into this space. We want to be mindful to have an anchor to support the system in utilizing something accessible. But you'll notice with Sandra, it wasn't necessarily a personal experience of bravery. I knew that she had watched that movie so many times and she had talked about how much she admired this spunky little girl and how much her granddaughter reminded her of Merida. And her brain had built the sensory awareness and a narrative around this cartoon character that that was actually a great and safe anchor for her. We can also even utilize colors or we can of course use personal experiences, songs, even scents. Somebody wants to feel energized. Just think about you know what it's a really fresh orange. When you smell a fresh orange, how does that smell or peppermint? Your brain might go, oh, you know, what if I was energized? And you just reflect on that scent. Or if you use sensory elements in your own practice or in your life, oils, you'll notice, oh, your system can shift and change with the sensory pieces. Those are all great anchors. Most important part always is client-centered. The client needs to have that connection. So if you bring up an element where you go, well, you were so brave in this moment, and the client goes, no, I wasn't. Okay, Amy wins. We're not going to use that as an anchor. We want to really support their mind-body system and in linking into what feels real for them, what feels authentic, so that that becomes their felt sense truth. So I'd like to invite everybody to take a moment 
and notice an energetic state you would like more of right here, right now. Now, let's flow back across the course of your life and notice if there's been a time that you have felt this way in the past. Notice if perhaps you have experienced somebody else embodying this state, such as Merida in the movie Brave. If this has a scent or color to it, Link into and tune into what is coming up for you. And invite in a gentle inquiry, exploring. On a scale of zero to 100, where does that statement, I am, whatever that feeling state is, fall on that scale? I am brave. I am energetic. I am whatever it is. Now, some of you might have come back and said, oh, it's like a 5%, if even, or even a 2%. Our response to that is, that's great. 2% of you is saying that's possible. We can start there. 2% is enough. 1% is enough. 0.5% is enough. Because it's possible. Others might say, wow, I'm already at a 95%. Well, then you can go into that embodiment. I am. Amy's on board. Cool. We love that. We want to be in very intentional relationship with the amygdala, inviting her voice to this conversation. It's one of the things that happens so often is we are taught to shut down and close out our feelings and specifically the hardenings. I know I grew up in the Midwest where everything was fine. That was a big part of the kind of daily dialogue. How's the weather and how are you? Oh, it's cold today and I'm fine. Especially in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of conversation around emotional intelligence and the purpose and the feelings of, and the purpose and the intention of feelings. And so being very mindfully aware that we want to invite the amygdala into feeling these experiences and deepening that relationship. Uh -oh, we'll go to questions here in just a moment. And also, I want to highlight that as you're finding an anchor, we can use physiological experiences as an anchor for an emotional one. So anybody ever felt strong physically? Like you've lifted a big box, you go to the gym, and you do some a great workout, you're like, yeah, I am strong right now. That feeling state can be used as an anchor to start to create an internal sense of emotional strength. So it doesn't have to necessarily be based fully emotional at the outset. Same way we can use an external figure to bring in an internal sense. So let me go ahead and open us up for questions here. I'm so sorry, Rebecca. I'm so used to you popping in and unmuting and, and asking questions. I was just waiting patiently for you. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> All right. All right. We've got a couple good ones here. And Rebecca, if there's a couple more, let's go ahead. We can answer those too. Okay. The thinking brain, cognitive brain, the PFC cortex, when does it begin to develop before or after birth? Are fetuses thinking or just feeling? Oh, that's a million dollar question right there. I know cognitive memories typically do not start until well after birth for me, somewhere in age three. Yeah, so most of us are born with something called infantile amnesia. And that's why we don't have a lot of memories from when we're infants and toddlers. Now, some people have magical, amazing, powerful brains where they do actually have these very early, early childhood memories. And most of us do not. And usually when the hippocampus starts coming on board, which is between the ages of kind of two and a half to four, four and a half, depending on each unique brain, 
that's where we start having concrete narrative memories as declarative. I can remember this happened. There's facts involved, sensory elements, visual components to it. Prior to that, though, as we've been talking about the amygdala is on board all the way back in the third trimester and our more sensory body memories are starting to develop much sooner. The basal ganglia and other memory systems are coming online before the hippocampus does. The prefrontal cortex is pretty slow to the development process in terms of when it is fully formed, but we are learning and exploring across the course of our infancy, our toddlerhood, our childhood, our adolescence, and onwards. And we're learning how do we respond to the world around us. There's some really interesting research about um, very young children. I believe they're about a year and a half old. And they had, they were with their caregiver, and then they had the um, person who was running the study do something, and it was benign, obviously, but the caregiver holding the toddler goes, oh, no. And the infant looked at the caregiver's face and then looked back and then at the person running the study and then looked back at the caregiver's face and then went, changed their expression to match the caregiver. Well, on those same lines, when this person running the study that the infant or the toddler did not have a relationship with, when, oh no, but the caregiver stayed calm and grounded, the infant would look at the person running the study and then take the cue off of the caregiver and stay calm. So our, our caregivers are the surrogates for our nervous systems. And so while it may not necessarily be full-blown thinking beliefs, that is developing once we're born now is our pre are we thinking and feeling believing in the womb uh, we do not have evidence of that the system is developing now there might be some other literature out there but as far as i am aware that it's when we're born that we're starting to start to intuit now would a one and a half year old or an eight month old have a sense of i not necessarily, but what they what we do have are a lot of learned behaviors and experiences, and we are tuning quote, closely to the world around us. And our facial expressions, going back to the comment on vo vocals, going back to the facial expression of the supervisor for Jeff, or the producer for Jeff and the supervisor for Wesley, we start attuning and identifying facial expressions very, very, very early. The fusiform gyrus is our facial part of the brain, and that is an early developer in the process once we are out in the world, especially our caregivers' facial expressions, because they help us stay alive. If our caregiver's face is frozen in fear, it's very helpful for an infant to go, I need to be quiet now, because there's something happening. So the developmental phases, when we're looking at helping our clients and ourselves understand the impact of these case elements are really, it's really good data to share. Because these triggers like we were talking about go all the way back for a very, very, very long time. And the amygdala is running alongside all of that. Ah, there must be a direct link between havening and the HBA access. Yes, there is. Absolutely. Our amygdala manages a lot of the body stuff downstream as well as our upstream processes. It's tied into our physiology quite closely, hence the autonomic as well as the somatosensory elements. And especially that is evidenced by those decreases that we see in blood pressure as well as decreased heart rate and enhanced heart rate variability. So if we're able to calm all of the stress hormones down and bring our system into a more stabilized way of and balanced way of functioning on a regular basis, the better able we are to navigate the world. The outcome being not just that we're less stressed and have de decreased inflammation, but the outcome also being that we have a stronger immune system. We are more physiologically resistant to viruses. Hey, we've all been dealing with that one, right? To all sorts of different experiences in the world. So a calm brain, I like to say, is a happy brain. And it doesn't mean that it's not a brain that's functioning and able to upregulate into threat when it needs to, or you know, hit the brakes if we're going to rear end somebody because they just cut us off. That's still a calm brain, but it's a responsive brain rather than a reactive one. Um, how work with sleep issues stemming from amper, uh, oh, the AMPA receptor effect. Is that it? I'm assuming that's what we meant. Um, 
So I, I'm assuming with sleep issues tied to the AMPA receptor, that would be going into conversations around nightmares and things like that, uh, difficulty sleeping, stress, insomnia. Uh, we do have quite a few videos that tackle this on the TikTok channel as well as the YouTube channel um, that we can utilize these tools to help the amygdala calm down prior to going into sleep. CPR for the amygdala is one of my absolute favorite tools for my insomnia patients. And I'm also a cranky sleeper, as I like to say, because our amygdala carries data with us into the night. And if we've had any activation points during the day, when the rest of our world isn't being distracted by emails or you know, Instagram or you know, our family and our friends or whatever it might be, in those quiet moments before sleep, our amygdala does love to perk up and make known all of her worries and concern. Does anybody else experience that? I do. All of a sudden, my entire list of everything that I was supposed to get done during the day just crashes into my brain, and a sleepy, sleepy brain is no longer available to me. So we can use that CPR for the amygdala plus the creating possibilities protocol that we'll finish learning here in just a minute to create a really beautiful navigation into sleep. First, for calming the brain down and by slowing the brain with the havening touch, bringing on those slow brainwave states of theta and delta, you're helping the, the amygdala step back and also let go of, get space from whatever is percolating. And the caveat I always give my clients is if it crashes back in, grab a piece of paper and write it down because then your thinking brain and your amygdala know that it's concretely there and you're not going to forget it. That's a big reason why our brain ruminates on things. It's going, remember, 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 pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. So if we write it down, we go, hey, brain, look, I wrote it down. That can help. Once we've calmed the system down and that old thing about counting sheep, that's a great distraction if that's a good one for you. Then you can use that creating possibilities, that what if question to inquire, what if I was sleepy? What if, what if I was sleepy? And that neuroscience data for the clients and for yourselves at this touch is bringing in some of those sleep wave states is very helpful because your brain is getting sleepy waves. It's a little bit of a sleep hack, calming the system down. Very, very, very helpful. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. I see a lot of other great questions um, here. So I'm going to flip us back to the Creating Possibilities protocol. We'll finish that out and then we'll come back and I'll answer the, these other questions. And I realized I stopped my, I did stop my share, but I also stopped the uh, actual presentation. So let me open that back up. There we go. All right, so by seeing the right stuff, Cool. So the client has shared with us that there is an emotional or a feeling, or it can even be a cognition, something that they would like more of to support them going into a new experience, like Sandra, brave, uh, something that would help them in this moment or help you in this moment being grounded or energetic. And then you've worked with them or you've supported yourself in finding this new anchor and connecting more fully to that. And when we find the anchor, it's very helpful to link into the sensory elements. Remember, our amygdala speaks the language of the senses, as does our working memory. So what are you seeing or hearing when you think about that anchor? When you think about, for Sandra, when she was thinking about Merida on that bear running, holding on to her, she's like, she's going, she's following her dream. She's courageous. She's brave. She was able to remember the joy of watching and experiencing that. And then she could also hear her granddaughter's giggles and how much they love that scene. And then the protocol, once we have that anchor, utilizes what's called mental rehearsal to get the brain flowing in the direction that we want. Here's a, a little important piece of data. Because of that negativity bias, Stress-induced structural plasticity becomes the freeway, and it becomes a felt sense truth very quickly. Because of the rapid firing nature of that, it can actually heal and step back somewhat quickly too. Building resilience and positivity and building with neuroplasticity takes intention and time. 
So you might notice that things calm pretty quickly with the CPR for the amygdala, but things take a little longer with the creating possibilities protocol. That's normal. Just like if you were learning a new skill, you'd have to practice it. Think about the creating possibilities protocol as muscle memory. The more you practice, the stronger it gets. And also, side note, the more you apply the havening touch, the more muscle memory you develop for it. And eventually, you can imagine applying the touch. You don't even have to do it. And your system will start to go into that soothing brainwave state. Now, is that a great life tip? You betcha, because you can do distractions in your mind and imagine you're applying the havening touch in a situation where you feel a little on edge. Holiday tips, y'all, if you go see your family and there's any nuances there and nobody will know the difference. So we start with that what if and curiosity empowers the possibility. So we're going to ask that inquiry five times, ideally changing the nuance of the inquiry each time. What if, what if I were, what if I were shifting the emphasis on those words? What if, what if I were brave? All the while applying that havening touch. And remember, you've linked into that anchor and brought it to life with the senses already. And you've rated it on that scale of zero to 100. So you can get a sense of what is Amy on this from that what if, if it feels comfortable after that five repetitions, that mental rehearsal of exploring and Google searching the possibility, you can check in and explore. Does it feel like you can be, or for yourself, does it feel like I can be? Gradually building a sense of capability. This could also be posited as a question. Can I be? So what if I was, can I be? Or what if? to I can be. It's as though we're slowly walking into some water, wading in, the water's beautiful and calm and warm. It's, it's been a while since you've swum. And so you're just trying all of this on. Same thing five times, I can. Expanding the options and each repetition is encouraging the brain with, because of that havening touch, to Google search opportunities to find more like minded data. It's we're reverse engineering that CPR for the amygdala now. When we're activated, Amy and the hippocampus and the working memory systems, gossip, 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 all the hard stuff. Here we're going anchor on the positive thing. Let's Google search that with intention. Go get it, Amy. Find that good, yummy stuff. And then we're checking in. Does it feel like I will be? Will be in five seconds from now, not will be in a month. We, we can't tell the future. In five seconds, does it feel like I could possibly go a little more deeply into this and also look towards some guided intentional future engagement, creating a new possibility about future possibilities? So we're staying in the present. And remember, we create the present and build the future with this protocol um, with all of the havening work that we do. So present and now we're going, hmm, I will be. And then we will check back in on a scale of zero to 100. And if the brain is at 95% or more, and by brain, of course, Amy's buy-in is going, hmm, yeah, I am, actually feels quite possible. Right now in this moment, 95% of that energetic state is accessible to me. Then and only then do we advance to an affirmation. We don't want to give Amy any sense that we are not listening to her or, not in, or that we're not hearing her. Her felt sense of safety is foremost because she plays that critical role in cultivating the case for self. And what we're doing now is building in new experiences of self and linking that in so Sandra's case for self now began to develop a link to being brave. For her, it took several sessions of doing this protocol, as, as well as doing our narrative work, our psychodynamic work, our cognitive behavioral work. And I integrate a lot of these things together with the basis being the neurobiology. What do we need right here, right now? And also her practicing this in her day-to-day -day life. 
just as we're walking through it right now. The more we practice and harness this opportunity with a safe relationship with the amygdala, the more we create that spaciousness for this to happen. And the, Rebecca, I'm sure we'll put in a wonderful guided exercise, but we'll do a small practice here and then I'll turn us over for answering additional questions. So take a moment and return back to your identified feeling state that you would like more of right here, right now. And that anchor that you found a moment ago. I'll invite you Start applying that soothing haven and touch. And leaning into an opportunity to deepen your relationship with that anchor. Spotlighting it in the here and now. That time when you felt this before or an experience that reminds you of this feeling state, somebody who embodies it, much like Merida and Bray, or even a color that represents this space, this energy. And on a scale of zero to 100, where would you rank yourself right now in that I am statement? The idea of you are embodying this right now. Once you have that information, if you're below a 95, extend some gratitude to your mind and body system for feeling safe to share with you. It's truth right here, right now. For letting you know that this is something that is wanted, doesn't feel fully accessible. It's a gift when our systems share with us their truth. I'd like to invite you either, either aloud or in your mind to start to begin to explore the sensory elements and this question tied to this identified state. What? Repeating that question in five unique ways, changing the emphasis on the words, exploring the possibilities of it. What if I was? What if? What if I were? Inviting your mind to get really curious about what it would feel like to embody this space, this energy. There's no pressure to strengthen it. It's just an exploration. What if? And once you've asked that question five times, notice how it would feel for your mind and your body to try on the I can me, completing that sentence with your chosen energy. I can be calm. I can be brave. Whatever it might be. Now, if any part of you goes, mm -mm, I don't feel like I can be, thank yourself, your mind, and your body for that information and go back to the what if. You've been given a gift. Begin exploring with those what ifs again. And if you are the I cans and that feels safe and comfortable for you, let's explore into the possibility of a little future shift. Will I be? I will be. Again, inviting your mind to tumble through that possibility to explore it. Google search the possibilities of it. I will be five times. And if anybody found their mind or their body going, mm -mm, but you got to the I can's, go back to I can. Or go back to the what if. We're planting the seeds. We're inviting the mind to connect and open up to new possibilities. We're creating the space for what should have been but wasn't to explore into these beautiful spaces 
these energetic presentations and connecting. And from there, if it feels comfortable, let's circle back and check in on that idea of zero to 100. Once again, noticing where would you rank yourself as you reflect on this energetic state? Has it shifted or changed? And if you find that you happen to be at a 95 or above, go ahead and move into that I am space. I am. Five times inviting your mind to really notice and be present with that I am. And if you're not there, that's beautiful. Because your mind and your body are sharing with you and you are cultivating security and safety within the system by leaning in and allowing all of these states to be present. You're creating trust with your own brain, which is critical. It's a vital part of that case for self. And return back to wherever you feel most comfortable. What if I will or I can? And as we conclude this exercise, I'll invite you to welcome in a gentle breath and notice if that anchor has an energetic space in your mind or your body. Or perhaps if there's something in your environment that you can link it to. That when you see that color or that object in the future, you can be prompted to once again revisit this energetic state and that inquiry, what the building of muscle memory and intentional anchors in our world, allowing ourselves to have spotlights around us for those moments when we forget to spotlight the good and our brain gets a little too busy, the less than preferable. Beautiful. So I'll come back to our questions. I just want to take a moment and say thank you to all of you for being here. It has been such a joy. It is an incredible honor to be in this space with you. This is uh, book launch week and it's just amazing to see how all of this has been coming to fruition for years and years and years. And if you have questions, we have we are a very shareware space. And as we already highlighted, I'll send out the specific handouts that are printer ready, the ones that we use in our own clinic. So you can print them, laminate them. We do all those things. I'll also include the brain diagram so that you can use that. It's very handy. And there's a lot of data on our YouTube channel. And also know that on my TikTok channel, basically all I do there is respond to one question every day, two to three minutes of neuroscience on trauma, mental health, whatever it might be. It's literally just, you get bite-sized tidbits of me. So if you have questions, use that, put them into the TikTok channel. And I've seen a lot of uh, my TikTok people here, which is so cool to see your names popping up. So hi, I saw you. I know you're here. Yay. And I, you'll know I do respond. It's such a gift to share this information with the world. And the more that we have happy brains, we have a happy, healthy humanity. And that's really the goal for all of us. So the recording will be available for two weeks. The handouts will be available. Uh, if you want to go deeper, we do have a one-day course with PESI that's all about take the beginnings of some of this clinical work for working with acute traumatic encodings. And in that workshop, we do talk about integrating this with EMDR and CBT and internal family systems and all the good, 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 yummy stuff. Because remember, we're back in the primal brain. All of our thinking brain stuff is just as important. It's the integration opportunity to really support our clients and ourselves. So I'll swing back over to our Q&A here and pull us out of this share screen. And the reference, references are also on the slide deck. And there's a lot of great research articles there if people are looking for the references. Okay. 
Um, so I will answer a couple. Oh, we've got good. Yes, I, I, I did. I did well saving space for time for Q&A. So if there are additional questions that have been upvoted, Rebecca, please put those in the chat box. All right. So what are ways to stop the I can't do this mindset with relax anxiety? Ah, such a wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> and a very personal experience of mine as well. Uh, relaxation and me have had a very complicated relationship for years. I do like to go. Um, so that's where the electrochemical shift that we do see with the Havening Touch is so supportive. Uh, yesterday, I was very, very, very blessed to have an opportunity to sit down with Dr. Ariel Schwartz, who does an incredible amount of somatic work. If you're not familiar with her work, she's got a number of amazing books, a great YouTube channel. And she talked about how she integrates the Havening Touch with her somatic practices and EMDR. That is a really great resource to go and listen to that interview. It's on the PESC Facebook page. Uh, so do check that out. But when we start to apply the havening touch, because this is part of our innate biology, it can downregulate the system. It will downregulate the system. Again, recognizing that for some people, touch might be complicated, and then we can use those touch modifications. One of my favorites is using um, silly putty. If you've ever made balls or snakes with silly putty, well, guess what? Your palms are still getting the engagement, but the system isn't thinking about it as touch. It's thinking about it as silly putty. I don't recommend Play-Doh. Play-Doh dries out very, very quickly. Just a side note. But in that way, we can start to distract by the creating space or the distractions through even the interaction with the silly putty while downregulating the brain into that theta gamma space. The I can't do this is an amygdala informed. These are core values. We link in what we call them cognitive flashbacks, even that cartoon of stupid is a cognitive flashback. It's something being said enough times that the self takes it on as a core cognition, maladaptive cognitions, right? And so this is a really powerful way to start to create space from any of those types of thoughts. The I can't do this, I'm not good enough. I'm broken, I'm a failure. All of those have been encoded into the neurobiology. And that can become a pretty big roadblock to utilizing these types of tools. And often that's more deeply tied to a sense of not being deserving of one's own healing, which to me is highly, highly, highly indicative of developmental trauma and complex trauma. Since it being a burden, not you know the self being identified through fawning or through the role that the child has had to learn to play for the caregivers that didn't allow for a sense of self to, to really come into beingness and self-care is a part of that so there's a lot of the nuances of the amygdala core values there and that's a great space to again start with the possibilities much like i did with that little girl i was sharing about possibility of something possibly being different, dipping the toes into something, playing with silly putty, and even talking about the possibilities of possibilities and start to create that space. Baby, baby, baby steps when we're working with these really sticky brains. Can, so let me shift into the next question here. Can havening results be remembered by people living with dementia? They may not remember the process, but maybe remember how it feels. I wonder if an anchor can be made for that. You work with folks with, folks with dementia. Yes, the havening, we have actually seen, and we have a number of individuals who work in hospice. We have a lot of phenomenal nurses who've integrated this into their work as well. And I know I've had times when family members have been very unwell and their brains haven't been quite available. And I've taught the nursing staff, especially during the pandemic, to apply the havening touch. It's very, very, very supportive in downregulating the system and helping the brain get some space. And specifically with dementia, if it's the more traditional dementia and they have access to childhood memories, that can be a beautiful anchor. I know um, I have an aunt who has one of the most joyous laughs in the entire world. And when I reflect on that laugh throughout the course of my childhood, I can go all the way back to you know, 1988, 1989 and hearing that laugh and just start going, oh yeah, I've got the sensory memory of that. So we can definitely use those anchors. And the application of that havening touch will soothe and calm the system as well. Uh, I believe there's another book that was written by Harry Pickens, or it's a, he did a kind of an, a, uh, what's the word? Anthem, not an anthology 
um, combination, sorry, just a little sidebar. I, I had encephalitis many, many, many years ago and I have a little bit of brain damage and I lose words sometimes from that. I think I did pretty well today though. Um, but a combination of interviews and stories of people who've been utilizing havening. And in that book, a, a couple of the individuals do talk about their work with um, individuals who have dementia. So definitely worth checking out. Um, request a re-demonstration of the self-havening patch. Okay, I'll do that in just one second and kind of how I introduce it. That's a, a great way for us to wrap up here. Um, let me get to, so before we do that, this is great clinically and I will use it. I am concerned about people who are not licensed practicing this modality. Is there a difference between the clinical and the non-clinical work? This is a great question. And yes, absolutely there is. Uh, so first going back to the very beginning disclosures about scope of practice, it is so important and also required that everybody be mindful of their own space in terms of scope of practice. What is it appropriate for you to be sitting with and utilizing these healing tools with integrating it into your care? And so keep in mind that just as if you haven't been trained to work with trauma, if you're not a licensed mental health practitioner who has been trained to do trauma work, you would refer that person out, right? That's our scope of practice. That's our ethics. That's the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. So just as if we don't have that training, that same scope of practice construct applies here as well. And we also know that there are many highly functioning humans walking around with cases for self that do percolate and get in the way. And so that's where somebody might go do some addition, some type of work around performance and where these tools can be very supportive for an athlete in a performance space where they're working with a coach and they've got an amygdala that's going, man, I kept missing that shot over and over and over again. And go, well, let's do a little CPR for the amygdala around that. And then let's do some classic coaching visualization and bring in that creating possibilities. So the self-havening work that you've been learning today, that is CPR for the amygdala, the creating possibilities protocols, everything that's in the book. There's a reason why this is a clinical and a public facing book. Those are tools that have been designed very mindfully to be safely brought into the world. And there's very specific structures around how to use these, hence the emotions thermometer. And that idea of we're sensing things, we're not going to go find traumas and spotlight them. That's trauma reprocessing that belongs in the clinical space. So when it comes to our more traditional autonomic nervous system regulation, this is where these tools are very, very helpful. And it ups the ante and the power because we're working with the brain. And we all, we've all got one. If we're sitting here, we've got one. And we've all got stuff that's happened that our brains remembered. And sometimes it gets in our way, part of being human. In the clinical space, we do have very specific havening techniques protocols that are designed for clinical care and integration into treatment. Those are much deeper, deeper, deeper tools. And we had trainings and workshops on how to use those tools safely. And I just mentioned one that I did with Pessy not too long ago, where you can start to learn how to work with actual trauma encodings and go much deeper in the work. And again, scope of practice, safety wins always. So yes, there's two separate spaces. I really appreciate whoever brought this question up because it's a very, very important piece. And so even for the Air Force, we've done treatment trainings, and then we've done the trainings that are self-havening, advocacy, uh, first responder trainings, different set of tools. Some of the self-havening ones, of course, go to the treatment space but the treatment ones do not go to the self-havening space ever. We keep those separate for safety. Uh, doing C uh, do CPP triggered feelings of grief about a long past relationship. I have worked on grief about this a lot. Yes, this is, goes back to what we were talking about, about how grief stays, loss stays. And so if while we're doing the creating possibilities protocol, whether it be for, for a reason like this. And that's come up for me too when I'm working on certain considerations around my own loss. But sometimes our amygdala will kick up some dust and get activated if we go from the what if to I can. And the next thing we know, our amygdala is going, who do you think you are? Going back to deserving this, those core values. Is it safe to even think about possibly feeling this way? Well, if that's there, then guess what? You have a tool for that. That's when you transition back to the CPR for the amygdala, because that's an opportunity to let your brain start to move through and heal that 
so that whatever that activation is can become a reprocess, a part of traditional information processing and not continue to guide this activation. And there are sometimes, especially around grief, where we want to keep a little bit of the bitter. That's okay too and normal. We want to hold on to that. And part of that frequently is because our brain is going, if I don't feel this pain around this anymore, does it mean I've let go? Does it mean I've forgotten them? Does it mean I'm not honoring them? And oh, there's so many what ifs around all of that information. And the main thing as somebody who's lived with a lot of despairing grief and somebody who does a lot of work with grief is remembering that the memories live on. They're within you. The people live on. The animals live on. The pets live on. They're with us. We carry them within us. So I know as we're coming to the end here, uh, let's do uh, that request for one more introduction to the Havening Touch so that we have that walkthrough experience for everybody. So when we teach the Havening Touch to our clients, we focus on four identified areas, palm havening, arm havening, face, and then around the cheeks. These four areas have evidence, so thinking about empirical validity, evidence base, all that good stuff, that highlights efficacy and the electrochemical shift that we're looking for. Now, we do know that, as I mentioned, these fibers that we're interacting with called C-tactile fibers are all over the body. But we're not teaching our clients that, going back to scope of practice, going back to clinical safety, what are we teaching? We're teaching what is proven. We're always staying with the science. That's what we do, it's important. And so these four areas have been proven and you have the citations for all of the, that good data in your references. And there's a whole bunch more. I could have given you probably, I think in the book, there's around 30, around 80 or 90 different citations, excuse me. So the first one is as though you're washing your hands under warm water. It's a wonderful way to describe it. Palm on palm, slow and gentle. Sometimes our clients will do this. You'll probably notice, or you have noticed that I switch back and forth between the two. Both get the same level of engagement. The second is that havening hug, fingertips on shoulders and down the arms. Inviting the system as though you're just giving yourself a nice hug. Or if you are an EMDR practitioner, you're used to your butterfly taps, we're basically taking that and then upping the ante, the power on the presence of those delta waves, because guess what? Butterfly taps by bilateral stimulation also enhance or strengthen the presence of delta waves and theta waves in the system. Then across the brow. So a good way to share about this with your clients is if you've ever had a tension headache, just as we describe it. And a lot of parents do this organically with infants, kind of run their fingers across their brow. I see this on airplanes with fussy infants and parents a lot. They just start doing this naturally. And then again, right under the cheeks. I know my, my husband's from India and, and yes, I am remarried now very happily so. And she shared with me that his gram growing up in uh, Mumbai would sing hymns and run finger uh, infinity symbols across his face at night when it would be hard to sleep, when there would be uh, things going, difficult things going on in the streets outside that they could hear. So it's these specific touches that are, again, pretty hardwired into our innate biology. We do these things organically for one another and for each other. And on the YouTube channel, there's a video of the introduction to the Havening Touch, as well as that modifications video that we mentioned earlier. So again, thank you, everybody. This has been an absolute joy. Uh, Rebecca, I'll check in and see, are there any final questions? Uh, I see her moving. For specific referrals for clinicians that are trained in encoded trauma work. Our, the, so EMDR has a referral list, um, the Parnell Institute, which is a, the attachment focused EMDR, they also have theirs. Of course, we have havening.org has a referral list. Um, you're also, again, welcome to reach out to us. Uh, we, have, we do a lot of trainings like these. We are blessed to sit with so many amazing humans and clinicians and practitioners and healers. And so we're also very happy to provide referrals because we have the list of the individuals who've trained under us as well. 
So those would be my, my primary go-tos. And then of course, if you're doing trauma work, really you know, be, be, this will help you that trauma-informed piece and educating our clients about this information is so normalizing because it's not us, it's our brain. And that's really kind of cool because our brains just learned how to keep us safe one way and we can now unwind that and move in a different direction and teach our brain another way of staying safe. Thank you, everyone.